I was vacation in Europe. Oh, Arizona. Welcome to a joint meeting of the City Council and the Planning and Zoning Commission. That's a joint workshop. A little bit about tonight in a minute. I'm going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and convene the City Council meeting. I'm going to let Max convene the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. And then I'm going to have a few remarks. And then we're going to move to the public comment so that everybody knows everybody will get a chance to speak. There'll be no limit as to the number of people. You will be limited as to three minutes. So, Matt, I'm turn, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I now call to order the May 9th, 2023 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And before we get back to your agenda, I would like to welcome Randall Halbert, who is our newest P&G commissioner. Welcome, Randall. Did you get baptism of fire tonight? Uh, thank you for your service, and thank you, Council, for being this new commissioner. Absolutely. So I'm going to open it tonight uh, before I do the public comments. I know there was a meeting last night. There was a workshop. Staff attended that meeting. Uh, there has been... Uh, and staff has seen it, we've seen it. A lot of misinformation on social media. I'm going to correct that tonight. It is not the intent of the city council to abdicate their responsibility to anybody. Council will still make all decisions as required by law about zoning. The Planning Zoning Commission, as they do in almost every aspect, will make a recommendation to the city council. But the city council and the elected officials will have the final say on anything to do with rezoning and certainly on even adopting the, the items we're going to discuss tonight, which are additional zoning categories. So with that, we're going to go ahead and open to public comment. And I'm going to read, we have one email comment. I'm going to read that into the record. And then I have a number of people, I'll just go the way they're numbered. Uh, and we'll call you to the microphone down there, and if you would identify yourself by name and your address, and then you'll have three minutes to address uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission and the, and the City Council. This was received from Susan Fortenberry on Tuesday today, May 9th at 12.35 p.m. Dear City of Sugarland, it's come to my attention that the City of Sugarland staff employees want to change the development code of Sugarland. If this measure passes, it will grant the City of Sugarland staff employees the authority to administratively approve development from here onward in the City of Sugarland without a vote by the Planning and Zoning Board, Commission, 
for the elected city council of Sugar Land. This is appalling and a great breach of the trust that the citizens of Sugar Land have placed in our elected city government. Please vote against this and do not allow the city staff employees to have more authority than the PNC board or our elected city council of Sugar Land. The citizens of Sugar Land should retain some measure of influence over the direction of growth for our beautiful community. All of the development proposals for the city of Sugar Land should go through PNC and the city council. If the elected city council abdicates its authority over the planning of future developments, then only the city staff will hold the reins to the direction of development from now onward in Sugar Land. This is appalling and frightening. The city of Sugarland was developed over many years into a beautiful, highly diverse, highly educated suburban community of mainly single family residences <laughs> where citizens raised families of children zoned to excellent neighborhood schools. We people want to move here because of all these qualities. People do not, please do not change the essential nature of Sugarland. We do not want Sugarland to turn out like some of our neighbors or like Houston. Please keep the sweet life in Sugarland. Please do not allow the city staff employees to have sole authority over how the rest of Sugarland is developed. Vote against this measure. And that uh, that concludes Ms. Fortenberry. We're going to move on now to our first guest, Deepak uh, Chandrani uh, uh, Chandra. Uh, Deepak? Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. My name is Deepak Chanwani. I'm a resident of Sugarland. My address is 2802 Century Oakway, Sugarland, Texas. I've been here about 12 years. So first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'd like to start by saying I am not opposed to the mixed use concept in the objective. I have seen this. I am a businessman. I live in Sugarland. I have my headquarters in Frisco, Texas. I've seen something like this being very successful there. And what I've seen historically, Sugarland has been voted as number one of the top cities to raise a family. Now you want to propose something that's going to change the demographics, which is going to bring in the other crowd, who drive less, spend more time here. If that's the economics you're working towards, then you are wanting to build things that will attract them. It's not the working family or the family but the people with the kids that are going to be occupying or buying into this what the new development or whatever the proposed development is. You need the new demographics to come in. They are not going to come in from downtown or other places and move here and work remotely. That's not what this demographics does. The key ingredients for this plan to work, which what we have seen in other places, is employers. And I'm not seeing in your plan where you have anything that suggests how you're going to be bringing in employers. So if this is to make business sense, this has to make complete business sense. And I see that as a gap. The whole concept of what I've read is pretty ambiguous. As you said, and to the earlier email you read, it indicates that the citizens will have no right or any viewpoint to bring into the table or work with their elected councillors, councilmen to voice their opinion. One minute left. Is it the city officials that get to exclusively decide on what happens? I don't think that's the right way to go about it. it sounds pretty undemocratic to me. This may need a revision from your perspective if you're reading it. City officials are not alone going to decide, but that's not what this indicates. I've tried to read it a couple of times. It's not making sense. So the process perspective, it seems broken or it seems missing key ingredients. But from your economic perspective, you're missing what's going to create that need for the younger generation to move into town and change what you're wanting to change. I don't see that in here. That's my viewpoint. Thank you, Deepak. Our second guest is uh, Tal Smith. Tal. Thank 
And my name is Tal Smith. I live at uh, 3031 Dahlgren Trail in Avalon at Telfair, which is adjacent to the Smart Financial Center and uh, Track 5. We've been residents of Sugarland since 2012. We moved here at that time because we thought Sugarland offered us the uh, suburban lifestyle and the tranquility that we wanted as opposed to city living uh, with the traffic and congestion and crime and the high density population. Uh, we've been happy here. We think uh, Sugarland is a marvelous community. We really think things have worked well. Uh, but if we're going to be uh, faced with the possibility of, uh, of a considerable amount of, uh, of apartments and things of that nature, we think that changes our view uh, considerably, both figuratively and, and literally. I have two questions. Uh, the first one has a couple of different parts. Uh, the proposed language to amend the code. Is there any precedent for this language in any neighboring city or any place in Texas that we might take a look at? Uh, secondly, uh, who drafted the code? Was there anybody other than city employees that were involved in, uh, stands in developing the code? Uh, the uh, third, third part, I would like to turn to page 68 of the, uh, of the, and I'd like to have a clarification as to what the intent or the meaning. <laughs> is one uh, minute left last paragraph, last paragraph involving dwelling which reads in part a dwelling is a cluster of at least five attached or detached single family homes and then it further goes down to say of five or four factory built small single family detached dwellings provided that each home meets the standards and that each dwelling has any wheels removed or is, is mounted on a permanent foundation and is connected to public water and utilities. Uh, it's, it sounds to me more like a trailer park than anything, and that's a great concern. Uh, my second question is, and I know I'm running out of time, under the current uh, code or current language that prevails in Sugarland, can a developer build large multifamily apartments on track five? And if not, would he be able to do so under the proposed change in language? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Our next guest is uh, Alpana. Okay, thank you. But can we get answers to those questions that tell me? You can. We're not going to. We're not going to give answers. We're not going to have a dialogue with the public. But we will certainly have answers prepared and 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 sent out. We'll post them on the website. Our next guest is Anu Kalkarni. I just wanted to mention. Oh, could you go to the microphone, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Good evening, everybody. I'm Anu Kulkarni. I'm a resident of Sugarland from past 10 years, and I would like to live here and also maybe retired like too. So I, I moved here because of my kids' schooling. So I, I assume just like me, everybody else might be moving to Sugarland based on the nice way of living as a community and also maybe schools and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I want, I would like to see um, more job opportunities created in the Sugarland instead of um, other any other kind of uh, uh, business moving into Sugarland so that we can thrive and have a diverse community 
uh, established in the Sugarland and then continue to enjoy Sugarland as a top 10 in the country. So my uh, opposing line is based on what was the research done, what kind of data we have collected, um, and is that leading to more job opportunities and younger kids and young families moving into due to the schools and uh, happy uh, family living together as a diverse community, then uh, no problem. But I do not see the modification is based on that. I see modification based on without getting uh, input from the citizen, but based on the um, analysis done from the Sugarland um, other staff who uh, I, I don't have a more detail on that, but not based on the input from the planning and zoning commission or the citizens. Thank you. Can we get an Thank address? You. Can we get an address, please? Oh, yes, ma'am. Could you uh, could you give us your address? 4515 Gillingham Court. Thank you. Our next guest is Samita Ghosh. Samita Ghosh, uh, uh, online address 4607 Nisha Court, 77479. So um, I'm going to, uh, in case I run out of time, uh, what I, I had a few questions. And part of the questions involve this whole process itself. Um, what exactly is the process flow? This is the most bizarre change in code I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I've been involved in a few others, but I'll just go back to the you know three to five year process that went in to change the land use code and the related to whatever. And this basically, I went to the thing yesterday and I'm like, the fix is in. Cause I'm like, where's the transparency? The mayor has just said, we're not going to even have a chance to have our camp questions uh, responded to in a public forum. What, are, what, what, what planet do we live on where that doesn't happen on such a dramatic change in the code? Especially one that not just council and whatever, but our own citizens spent years changing the land use plan and the comprehensive plan and all of that. But um, And then what happens when things go wrong? Um, I was involved in the ethics code changes. Um, uh, the employees who are going to review these are not going to be subject to the ethics code. Um, they're going to have their own employee ethics code. So where's the oversight for these changes, the decisions, important decisions that are going to make be made? There's going to be no accountability for city employees. Um, and then where's, again, where's the community input and transparency? Um, so um, in terms of the process flow, what we ha I have seen, I was actually disgusted and horrified by what I heard yesterday because it was the most patronizing, disdainful, um, anti-Sugarland rant that I can only call it that yesterday. It made basically demeaned my lifestyle choices. Like, why am I not, you know, why am I not in my little Tesla or my two-wheeler parked in front of my three-story apartment not go eating out and enjoying the disco or something. Uh, why am I not supporting businesses? Well, he compares us to Detroit. I'm like, what you need to do is compare us to A-Leaf. You don't have to go all the way to Detroit. A-Leaf is what 90% of my community has left because they know what happens when improper uh, multifamily moves into your backyard. Your housing values drop. And again, I'm like most people here, I'm not against multifamily. I used to live in... San Francisco, they know how to do work play. You don't want to Californize it. Well, I'm not saying you Californize it, but don't alifize Sugarland. We came here for a certain lifestyle, and that is what this is going to destroy. And I resent people from outsiders from Denver who tell me, oh, this is not the right way to live. You need to just suck it up and live with 25% less parking because you, you drive to too much. So thank you very much. Our next guest is Billy Atkinson. Howdy, good to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Billy Atkinson. I live at 21 
Ellicott Way here in Sugar Land. I'm a 25 year resident and homeowner of Sugar Land and lifetime Fort Bend County. We have an extremely well managed city here in Sugar Land, as we've all discussed. Our balance sheet is strong. Our revenues continue to rise. Our city has neighborhoods of homes, parks, schools, and churches providing comfortable and safe places to live and dwell. The comprehensive proposal for the new mixed use zoning code and approval process is concerning to me, and I'm sure many others who take the time to study it. Sugarland and its voters have addressed high density development in the past. Moreover, the city has adopted strategies and land use plans over the years, which are opposed to the development changes we see here today. In this new proposal, it's apparent that the RACs and the NACs mixed use pod type approach is intended to increase the utilization of all such available open or dilapidated spaces for high density development of varying mixed use types. This missing middle includes dwellings no larger than a mobile home without wheels, as we talked about earlier tonight, page 68, and multi-story apartment projects, which will cast shadows on existing neighborhood single family homes. The density initiative also seems completely unwarranted financially. We have major hospitals, regional department stores, supermarkets, colleges, and many national and international businesses here in Sugarland who serve both us and the surrounding region. Sugarland is the center of commerce, not a population-based engine, not a population-based engine, which is the basis for this study. This study, the basis of the study and the resulting plan is that we need increases in population to support our city economically. Why? Why is it assumed that all the new high density occupants will spend differently than our community does today? How will retail, food service, or entertainment businesses, et cetera, survive on a two to 10 acre NAC or pod community? Municipal costs. We all know that the added density development will add to the city costs. This includes more infrastructure build and maintenance throughout the life of the multifamily project. Fresh water, water treatment, drainage, traffic infrastructure, fire, EMS, police, crime, animal control will all, will all be impacted, not just in building, but in maintaining for the long term. We can issue debt to cover that, but the debt has to count on sales taxes, property taxes, and fees. As, as you consider before, this, the developers who are ever present here today competing to build these pods simply will not be here 10 to 15 years from now. So well, here we are. Push. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest. Uh, I can't. Alan Reagan? No, Hello, and thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Matt Reagan. I'm with Freebies. We are uh, one of the developers he was just discussing. Yeah. Um, we uh, took over Sugarland Town Square in uh, 2019 to modernize, uh, to kind of bring it into the 21st century into Turn it around to make it the wonderful and meaningful town square that it is and always will be. And it'll be cool. And I've been very proud to be a part of this community and to be here. Um, and I think a lot of the concerns that I heard today are, are super important and they're important to get right. Um, I, uh, but the reality is that, that it, the way that especially millennials and young Gen Z live, they live a little differently. Than, than even myself, who's uh, older than me. And allowing our, our communities to be able to pivot and to be able to respond to that, to stay, to keep bringing the young. And it's not just about driving density, it's about driving quality density. There is a way to build multifamily that is additive to our home values. Not, not does it, that doesn't take away from our home values, is additive. It's important that we're getting the youth here and, and these mixed-use developments done well across the country have been added. Let's look at Legacy West in, in Plano. Thriving, thriving single-family home values across the board. And bringing in that younger generation 
in a way that's that makes that helps drive some of the drive business to drive their people who are working there. We stand at a really interesting period right now. Downtowns are struggling and they're going to continue to struggle. And suburban areas are, we can reap the benefits of that if we continue to make sure that we're grabbing the youth, that we're grabbing the younger generation and we're being able to do that. And a lot of them want these kind of these are a little bit more dense places, the places where they can go and, and still enjoy everything that Sugarland offers, everything that, that we've all just discussed, but also can enjoy a little bit of that urban sense and done in the quality way, which all we want. Like we win because it, it's expensive to build here, right? The land's expensive. We win when we build something of quality that drives single family values and that also drives us where we there's a way to do it where you get the right people where we're all in it together and i just i would getting this right and making sure that we do this right is important but i think that this there's there's a lot here to like and there's a lot here that needs to be changed and needs to be worked on from all angles but i, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the back water Thanks. thank you ma'am our next guest is don jansen don Good evening, Don Jansen. I live at 3915 Wood Hollow Court. And the reference to developers that come and go, I've been here since 1982 as a developer of First Colony. And what we've always tried to achieve here is quality. <clears throat> and you can take issue with certain developments and certain um, communities or different bits and pieces. But I've literally talked to mostly every company that has considered Sugarland as a new home. And because of that, I'm the person that people should talk to to say, what do companies really need? And what companies need is housing. They need the type of housing that fits all of their employees, not just the executives, not even the executive vice presidents, but the, the, the young um, kids, I call them, because they're a lot younger than me, um, that want to come to Sugarland. My son is 37, and we graduated from Baylor. He looked at coming to Sugarland. He didn't find a place that he wanted to go. So where did he go? He went to the St. James on River Oaks. And you could say, well, it's because it's so fancy. No, it's because it had all the amenities that that age group would like to have. And those are the people that are going to be the next generation of employees that are going to grow Sugarland. They're going to be the ones sitting right here making decisions for this community. So I think we need to grow up a group and provide a place. That's a place where everyone wants to live. So you talk about, okay, well, multifamily. I've heard this for the past 10 years, that it's the evil, the most evil thing you will ever see. These are people that live in a home. Their home happens to be an apartment. The apartments we're talking about building, you haven't seen in Sugarland. The only ones that are close to that are in town square. So if you think those people are the evil, uh, whatever people, then drive over there and talk to those people. And they're actually people just like you and me. People that go to work every day, they raise their kids every day. So if we want to exclude a certain number of people just because we don't like apartments, we don't really understand the apartments that are going to be built. The apartments that are going to be built are the podium pedestal. They have, uh, they're gated. It's a place where not only the young ones, but older generations can lock and leave and enjoy a lifestyle, whether they're young or old. So you can take issue with apartments, but you really don't, and I don't mean this disparagingly, you don't really understand the type of apartments that are being built, number one. Number two, you're saying that there's too many. Well, how many is too many? No one has ever told me how many too many is. We have the lowest percentage of apartments to single family residents almost anywhere in the state of Texas. There might be one or two less than that. So whenever you have in development, which we've developed all of First Colony, you have to have a balance. You don't want too much of anything, mm -hmm. but you need so much of apartments, so much of multifamily, I mean, uh, office, and so much retail. So as long as we achieve a balance and do it in a quality way, I think we've done a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next, our next guest is Coda Bagot.
Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm uh, Bhagat Kota. Uh, my address is 2714 Century Oakway. Uh, again, I'm a very recent uh, addition to the Sugarland family. I, re I just moved a year and a half back. And one of the main reasons I moved to Sugarland was of the good reputation Sugarland has in terms of raising a family and, and good schools. At least my brief review of the proposal, I feel very concerned. All the concerns raised by Anu, Deepak, and Bill, they're all my concerns as well. If the, the code for uh, dwelling property is so loose, that creates a lot of uh, potential disruptions to all the ni nice amenities and the facilities we have in terms of uh, growing uh, family here. So at least with the initial review, I uh, kind of oppose the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest is John Winderham. Jim Winderham. Vonderham. <laughs> My name is Jim Vonderhaar. I live at 103 Savoy Street and it's in Venetia States. I've lived in Sugarland since 1997. Um, I, I want to speak specifically to the, the, the proposal that's on the table. I read through that thing twice. Um, and that's a very boring read, uh, but uh, I, I want to start by, I commend the city for taking the effort to do this. I, I've mentioned this to our council person a couple of times that when we created the, the racks and the NACs back in the 2018 land, land use plan, um, we should have established those guidelines back then. So we kind of got the cart before the horse and now we're fixing that. So I commend you for doing that, but I'm going to disagree with the mayor here briefly about, about the lock, lack of control, control by the council. I know the council is not voluntarily abdicating their responsibilities, but there are a minimum of 30 references in this document to, to a director. We have no idea who this person or this entity is. And that, that person is allowed to make multiple decisions that in the past would have been or, um, turned over to the council or some other person. I have a problem with any staff person, regardless of their title, I'm having what appears to be a lot of authority. So I commend you for the document, um, but I think we should we should tighten that up and at the very least create a board that consists of a staff member, a council member, and maybe a, a citizen to help make some of those decisions. Um, but uh, So as it stands right now, I'm opposed to it. I'd like to see some changes made to it, and I think it'd be a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our next guest is Doug Gall. Doug? Okay. All right. How about that? All right. Good evening, everyone, uh, and, and welcome, gang. I know we're all here for the same purpose, that is to, to create a better, better city and, and life for all of us. Um, that being said, I, I, first of all, I live at one quiet Vista Drive in the Imperial neighborhood in Sugarland. I've been here for 33 years, something like that. Um, I've been in uh, the land development business, so I know uh, a little bit about what we're talking about here. Um, I, I want to say that we're at a threshold here in the city of Sugarland, because at this point where we have basically hardly any new land to develop, we have to come up with, with procedures and policies and strategies to even improve the quality of life for everyone who lives here, plus those who are looking to come to Sugarland. And uh, I can speak to uh, a few examples of communities that we've built and I hear so much negative about multifamily. I mean, we're, we're not doing Fondren Southwest. I mean, it, it, the point being here is, is that we have such high restrictions and high maintenance standards over a lifetime that uh, the multifamily we'll be creating is going to be a, an, an asset and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, something that's going to attract various uh, lifestyles and price points, young people especially. Um, in Siena, we have, there's over a thousand units as you drive into the community. And obviously there's not a single impact on a for sale property value. Same thing in Riverstone, same thing in our Harvest Green communities. 
when we do it right, you do it with strict architectural controls, and you do it with maintenance standards that, that are in place for 20, 30 years. Look at, look at the multifamily in, in First Colony. It, it's maintained impeccably, and it's not impacting any property values anywhere around it. It's been there for 20, 30 years. So my point being is that let's, let's, let's open our minds. Let's consider what I think this council and, and uh, commissioners are, are considering for the future of this city, and I totally support it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thanks, Good no, I think you're not the only one here that's here. Our next guest is uh, Alfana. I have been a resident of Sugar Hill for 23 years. I have loved my kids here. The reason we moved here for the quality of life. And I actually came back up here because I have a question for him. Um, speaking of Legacy West, my son lived there for a year working for Toyota. And the the area you're speaking of, I'm well aware of it. And the reason people live out there, there's Toyota, there's Bank of America, there is various big corporations that draw young individuals. We don't have such things in Sugar. Another thing, Legacy West, mom at Legacy, my son, was not happy to live there for long because there was a disco downstairs. There were crazy things going on. So if you speak from that perspective, I have no problem with progress. I think it's beautiful. When I went to Plano, they're doing great. Crystal's doing great. I would love that for the city of Sugar. I want my son to stay here, just like other gentlemen said. But what you're speaking of, you need, we need to understand from people who live there and what their experiences are. And this is our personal experience. The reason people live in Legacy West is because they're a big corporation. As Deepak mentioned, you have nothing. You're speaking of restaurants and ice cream shops. People are, a lot of the places in Legacy actually shut down. They're not open. And if you, I'm speaking from safety point of view, if there's clubs downstairs and people have to go to work and there's fights breaking up, what does that speak of our, our police officers? What, what we can't get people. What about traffic? It's crazy going to Legacy West. You couldn't get in and out. So give me all that. I am all for progress in Sugar Lane. But don't just brush off situations and say, yeah, 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 it works here, it works there. Give us true residents. Let us speak to them. Let them explain what their experiences are with such projects. And as Tal mentioned, these code changes y'all want to make. Have these been done around Houston area near Woodlands Memorial? What is the precedent for these changes? Why so quickly? Why isn't the residents involved? We get an email Friday. We're supposed to show up here Monday and Tuesday and not get our questions asked. As the mayor said, who are, we are the tax paying citizens. Those developers yourself, you will get a subsidy. You will get a grant. You will leave here. We're stuck with the bill. My appraisal came back. I'm paying a lot of money to live here. Our schools are going to go down. I mean, what? Is, sell me something that I can appreciate when you tell me it's bringing tax dollars that we can all share, but that's not the case. It is these developers are going to get subsidies. I know the whole picture. We do this too. We have places in Austin we built. But you, you're telling, you're, you're selling us something that doesn't register and you telling me that it's going to bring young people. Young people do not want to live here. There's not companies here. My son works at Shell. He, he's not going to live out here. He wants to live in town. You don't have anything to draw young people. Thank you. Thank you. I hope our questions get answered. Is there anyone else? We've got... Uh... If that's all I have for signed up. Anybody else would like to speak? Yes, I would like to. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let's take them one at a time.
Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay, so yes. It's a, so good evening again. Uh, my name is Pavan Lal. I'm a resident of uh, 2710 Century Oakway, uh, Sugarland. Uh, we moved here uh, 2007. So uh, some of the concerns uh, I have, I'll try to wrap it up in the short period of time. Uh, the code, uh, the, the way that uh, we make changes uh, to the, the development, I, I'm not going to speak exactly of the multi-mixed-use multi, multi uh, mixed use housing, but the code, the way it has been changed, that is a concern. The citizens should be involved at every stage of that, like we have been. So please be very aware that we do not like that. The second thing I heard uh, uh, from one of the consultants, if that's the rank, uh, is that the young generation will uh, move in and all that good stuff. But the young generation do need jobs, like Ms. Altna said, we do need jobs. I do not see even a single operation uh, which is on the plan to move in. Leave about moving in, floor is leaving us. So we need to consider creation of jobs as one of the primary focus of the city officials. The smart financial center, we live behind that. Uh, my house is behind that. When there's an event, it's a nightmare to get out of the community. So I can only imagine when we bring in the X number of apartments or houses, whatever it is, without increasing the infrastructure before. After being here for almost 16 years, I see an additional lane being added on university, which uh, is great. Thank you very much, whoever designed it. But before we consider all this, we need to see infrastructure improvement so that we can sustain what is coming after that. So let's talk about that, please. Now, when we bring in new families, which is great, we definitely need schools. How many schools, high schools, middle school, elementary schools are being planned on? We need to know that. And we don't need to know it on a Friday afternoon, please. We need time to, we are, we are uh, employees, I have businesses to run. So we need some time to address those concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest is Sri Krishna uh, Benakoval. You said it right. <laughs> Every once in a while, I get it right. But it's perfectly right. <laughs> Hi. For the record, my name is Sri Krishna Venugopal. I live at 4515 Wentworth Avenue, Sugarland, Texas, 77479. Um, I'm here. Okay. Let me first state that I'm a I'm not opposed to development. No one's opposed to development. I, re I respect Mr. Johnson's wisdom. I'm, I'm sure you know you've been here since '82. You've done a great job with with the uh, town center. But how can you, the way the code is written today, or whatever is being sent to us, there is no guarantee that you will get a town center. If you look at the greater metropolitan Houston area. How many town centers do you have? How many city west do you have? You have more apartment complexes. You have more crimes. I mean, I mean, a leaf is is and it's a very good example. Alpana mentioned that. Okay, a leaf is a very good example. And when I first came to Houston, I'm going to share a story. An older gentleman kind of told me that you want to move to the suburbs because he actually was on Farnham, a few miles down on 59. And people who drive down Fondren, I'm sure, see all those big mansions. What happened to them? What happened is they got, quote unquote, what we are referring to as mixed use development, which has apartments, which have dining, which have shopping, clubs, bars, you name. And if you look at the history of Fondren, it has an improvement. And there is no guarantee that what the city is proposing to do today is going to be beneficial to sugar. That's number one. <laughs> number two, I completely oppose the fact that we are going to write a code where anyone who, can, who has a two acre to 10 acre track can take it, go to the city, check a bunch of boxes, and get it approved. 
I mean, why am I here? Why are you folks here, the city council members? Why did we take the time to go out and vote for you all? Okay, so I completely oppose it. The way it's written, the is the same. It seems to be not getting to the city position as a tax paying on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? We're going to go ahead and close that portion. We're going to move on now to item number three, workshop review and discussion of draft changes to the development code related to the addition of two mixed use zoning districts. Uh, Ruth, I think you, you and uh, Matt Goble are going to lead uh, in the discussion. I ask for both B and Z as well as the council members. If, if you have a question, you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation, but if you let me know so I can call on you so that we don't have multiple people talking over each other. Ruth, go ahead. Um, so if not to be contrarian, but we would prefer that you wait till the end of the presentation if possible. Um, however, I understand that there may be an opportunity where you feel like you need to ask a question. We have provided you with um, a sheet there where you can jot down questions as they come up, come to your mind so that you don't feel like you're going to forget it if you wait till the end. Um, but I will, um, but if the mayor feels like we need to take questions, obviously that's what we'll do. But um, it would be helpful, I think, for you to hear kind of the bulk of the presentation um, because we may be able to answer those questions that come up um, later on. Um, so good evening, mayor, members of city council. Um, thank you for this evening. Thank you um, to the, the speakers and residents who are attending tonight and who came um, last night as well. Um, you know me, I'm Ruth Lomer. I'm one of the assistant directors of planning and development services. And I have here with me um, Matt Goebel. Um, the Clarion Associates, who um, we have been working with on um, developing this draft code. Uh, so tonight, this is a quick uh, overview of the council's development priorities. Um, we're going to talk about the project overview and um, give you a little overview of the code and um, a little bit of the design and then um, let you know how much Okay. Let me see if I can do this. Um, okay, so as you, um, many of you have heard now, we recognize as a community, we are um, kind of at a turning point in our life cycle as a city. We have um, evolved from a small town to a community that has gone through rapid growth, and we are now either approaching or even past that point of peak and, and moving into either decline, which is sort of the natural path that a city takes, or redevelopment if we take action and are proactive in um, moving our city forward. We know this because of a lot of data and analysis that we have done. Um, we have looked at our aging in terms of housing and population. Um, our The people here really like Sugarland, so they've stayed, and so they've aged here. So our overall um, average age has increased over time. Um, also, um, people staying here, our aging residents are having a difficult time keeping their homes maintained, and we're seeing that through increasing code enforcement throughout the city. Um, we also have an oversaturation of outdated, detached single-family homes. About 90% of our um, of our uh, housing is um, single-family, and we're really missing that middle housing, which is kind of between single-family and um, kind of your typical larger multifamily projects. Um, I think this, uh, to some extent, addresses some of the questions that people have asked um, this evening, but we have actually grown our jobs and our employment really effectively as a community. Um, between uh, 2015 and 2020, we went, um, we increased our housing by 14%, um, but we only increased our residences, um, excuse me, our jobs by 14%, but our housing only increased by 1.5% in that same um, time. Um, we went from um, increasing our number of homes at, at about 500 in a year in 2008 to this last year in 2022, we added a grand total of eight new homes in our community. That's it. That's, that's, that's the space that we have left is because there's just no room for them to go. Um, we also recognize that we are lacking um, the regional density and in and, and comparison to other communities and the purchasing power that comes with that. Um, and so that's impacting our retailers and um, you know, our ability to thrive. 
we're seeing some um, concentrations of um, single family rental in certain areas of our community, which is um, those impact, the impacts of the vacant homes and institutional homeownership is really impacting some of our neighborhoods. And then we've also been monitoring school trends and recognizing just those changing over time. And, and as many people have said, they came here for schools. And so that's a very important factor that we need to take into consideration. Um, as, as has been mentioned this evening, um, the land use plan was updated in 2018. And the vision in that document was that it would, we as Sugarland would be, would develop and redevelop to remain a desirable place for, for the future, um, and that we would change in response to shifts in market demands. Um, this land use plan was the first that really recognized the need to shift our focus to redevelopment from regular development. It also recognized that redevelopment is critical to maintaining the long-term fiscal health of the city. We, we um, will not be able to continue to maintain the kind of services that we operate today um, if we don't do something different. Um, and redevelopment is going to require us to trailblaze. It's going to require us to do things differently than we've done in the past. Um, we recognize that it's been over 20 years since we've had a major development come through um, our processes and be seen um, to fruition, and that's here in Sugarland Town Square. That's a really long time. Um, we've had several projects that, um, you know, have kind of gotten started, but they haven't been able to be followed through, Imperial. Um, or the area around um, Smart Financial Center. Those weren't intended to be standalone um, venues. They are intended to um, have stuff around them. Um, and so we started asking ourselves, why is that? Why aren't we seeing those changes? And as some of you have seen, we've gotten feedback from our development community partners. Um, and, and the feedback that we've heard is um, Sugar Land is old, has no energy, is arrogant, cocky, complacent. Um, we're gonna die with our controls that we are um, developing in Sugarland is a waste of time and money. And so these are all things that we've taken into consideration as we have been um, looking to how we can trailblaze into the future. Okay, thank you. Um, so what we're really talking about here is redevelopment in our activity centers, which were um, established in the uh, 2018 land use plan. Um, so here we're talking about these areas that are envisioned to be mixed use, compact, walkable areas, somewhat similar to here at Sugarland Town Square. We're not gonna have 15 Sugarland Town Squares around the community, we recognize that, but we're looking to emulate the kind of place that we have here, the, the space that people want to be. People don't come here to run errands, they come here to hang out and have fun and enjoy life with their family and friends. And so that's really what we're trying to recreate around the city. Um, these areas were based largely on their proximity to major roadways and also just existing level of activity that's already taking place there. Um, most of the areas are developed as car-centric, single-use development. And so in order to see these um, visions come to fruition, we're going to have to redevelop existing areas into something different. Um, so I do want to just point out that these um, redevelopment or regional and neighborhood activity centers are really the focus of the conversation for the mixed-use code. Um, it's only in these areas that we would be looking to designate the new zoning districts. It's, it's a small percentage of the community um, when you look overall. Um, and so we've kind of asked ourselves, how can we trailblaze now? Um, our development controls are, and processes are really working against us and our ability to achieve our desired goals for redevelopment for this vision um, that the community has. Um, and so what do we need to do to innovatively modernize our codes to make the path easier and more predictable than what it has been? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we really get into developing our mixed use codes, which is what is um, before you this evening. Um, so I'm actually gonna invite um, Matt uh, to come up and he's gonna walk you through the next handful of slides. And then um, I'll return in just a few minutes. Thank you, Ruth. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, council members, commission members, good to be here. Thank you all for the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the project, first of all, just the scope of the project, just to remind you how we got here. And then I'm going to start talking you through some of the first parts of the of the mixed use uh, ordinance that we have in front of you. And Ruth will <clears throat> join me in that conversation. But um, the question was, how do we spur that redevelopment in the activity centers? So the city issued an RFP, a request for proposals back in 2021. And our firm responded to that, and we were selected to work with you all. We're a zoning consulting firm. We work on zoning projects around the country. And so this is the type of thing that we have experience with in Texas and around the country. Um, and we're excited to be here. 
And one of the things that we did as part of phase one was to really talk with other cities that had done similar types of projects. Many cities have talked about activity centers in their land use plans like you have done. Our question was, what can we learn from them? And what can we really think about as best practices and pros and cons of different approaches to bring to the city of Sugar Land? And so uh, we, we, we did this phase one project, which was really focused on evaluating the best way to implement the ideas that you had come up with. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, how do cities do this? How do they encourage and incentivize redevelopment? So that's where we started. Um, we did a lot of research. I, I worked with my colleague, Gabby Hart, who is here as well. I think Gabby did a lot of this work. Um, we identified with your staff what we called peer cities. You know, for purposes of, of this type of work, who had done similar implementation of, of activity center zoning? And we talked with folks both in Texas and in other places in the country. So Plano, Fort Worth, Louisville in Texas. Uh, we also talked to Henderson, Nevada, right outside Las Vegas. We talked to Arlington County in the, in the D.C. area and Cary, uh, which is in the Research Triangle area in the North Carolina area. But that's a good cross-section of places that have looked at this type of, 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 of zoning issue. You know, Fort Worth has done a lot of thinking about different of ways of, of, of addressing mixed-use development, and, and we, we got on the phone with them, and we had good discussions. We didn't just look at their ordinances, but we, we talked with them about what they would do differently in the future and what they had learned from their experiences. Um, in addition to all that kind of, uh, pure city work, we talked with folks in the community. We talked with folks that had developed projects in Sugarland. We talked with folks that lived in Sugarland as residents. And we talked with a lot of you all uh, about your experiences with zoning. As part of that work, um, we summarized everything we had done in a report, the phase one report. You might recall, we talked with you all back at a workshop in November. Uh, Gabby and I were, were virtual on that. Uh, and, and Ruth and her team were here in person. And we talked about key themes that came out of all of our work. Those are summarized on this slide on the left-hand side. We had some just big themes. You know, first of all, emphasize the land use plan. That really needed to be the starting point of, of any zoning work that was done. You've had a lot of good detail there that we had to be faithful to. Build on what was unique to Sugar Land. Educate and build support in the community for these concepts. That's a big theme we, we learned about, the importance of from all those peer cities. Uh, simplify and incentivize redevelopment. Rein in the plan development process, because in the past, many cities like Sugarland had just been going after mixed use development on a case by case basis using that negotiated plan development tool, which is a bit of a black box and it can result in very good quality development, but it's unpredictable and it's not necessarily enticing to developers that would invest in the city. Um, and it doesn't provide predictability to neighborhoods about what's going to come in next door. And then down the right-hand side, zoning for mixed use. That was a big part of the report, all the different aspects of how do you zone for mixed use. And, and that's what we'll talk about tonight. Um, all these different pieces of, of how to zone for mixed use are really what we're implementing now in phase two. On this slide, though, I do want to highlight this bottom bullet on the right, supplement zoning with economic incentives. None of the communities that we talked with are doing all this work solely through zoning code updates. They're all recognizing that they have to have a robust package of public infrastructure improvements, and they have to have financial grant programs to encourage businesses to come in. And it's just the zoning is one piece of a puzzle to encourage efficient, healthy redevelopment of the type they want to see. So I didn't want that piece to get lost because the city recognizes that, that zoning is just one piece of that puzzle. So that was the phase one piece. Phase one was the recommendations. Phase two is actually coming up with some draft ordinance language to implement those ideas. That's what we'll work, talk about tonight. Uh, this, we've been working with your staff on that, again, based on those best practices. You all have had a very helpful and, 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 and robust task force uh, made up of many, many of the folks at the table to help us uh, get feedback along the way as we develop some of these ideas. You've been having meetings uh, throughout last year and this year. You've had resident engagement on redevelopment. You're going to hear more about those meetings uh, from Ruth later in this presentation. She's got a whole section just to talk about public engagement that's been done. We've also had some focused input from developers because they're some of the ones that uh, need to use the code ultimately and, and will help determine is it a valuable tool to encourage the type of uh, development you want to see. Uh, we had one of those uh, back in March, we had another one of those yesterday. And that's been very helpful feedback to think about just practical uh, issues to, to refine the drafts. So 
that's process. That's kind of how we got here. And um, again, there has been a public uh, aspect of that. Uh, it's been robust, I think, and, and, and Ruth will talk about that later in the presentation. But what I wanted to pivot to now is actually talking about the, the ordinance that's in front of you and, and to highlight some of the key things that I think um, just uh, we all need to be aware of as we debate the, the merits of the document. Big idea is that there are two new mixed use districts being put on the table that correspond to the activity centers that you identified back in 2018. There's a mixed use neighborhood center uh, for the, the NACs, neighborhood activity centers. Uh, that's the smaller scale, primarily residential with supporting commercial, you know, the corner shop or maybe a, a small uh, doctor's office or something, but it's, it's, a, it's a smaller scale. And then there's the larger scale, which is the mixed use regional neighborhood for the racks. So the racks and the racks, there's, there's five of the racks and there's nine of the NACs and, and you saw them on the map that, that Ruth put up there. You all know the purposes of these, we've talked about it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixture of uses, you know, uh, higher density residential with supporting non-residential with the idea that it's a more walkable place and you'll have potentially the ability to walk to work or to walk to shop, not for everything that you need to do, but maybe you're gonna have options that don't require you to get in your car for every trip that you need to make. Um, uh, the, the, the purpose was also to ensure that these were high quality areas. Sugarland has a robust tradition of high quality development and protecting neighborhoods. And this, this, this uh, effort moving forward needed to continue that tradition. So what we've really focused on as part of this project is what I like to say is expanding the zoning toolbox to implement the land use plan. You're gonna have more districts in your toolbox, more districts in the lineup. And an important thing to emphasize there is that they are not gonna be put on the map as part of this project. All this potentially would do is just, you know, adding new text to your zoning code and new districts that could be applied in the future. So the racks and the NACs, from the land use plan, that's the framework. Um, just adopting this language by itself would not do anything. You still would have an important role as a commission and as a council in actually applying these districts to, uh, on the map if you, if you chose to do so. And the development code establishes ways that rezoning can be done. You know, and it can be initiated, first of all, by the city. So you, we call these city initiated. You know, staff could kick that off, or where you all as the commissioner council could propose particular areas where you want to proactively go in and, 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 and initiate that rezoning discussion. And Ruth will talk about some areas where that actually is being proposed as part of this project later. Or you could be a property owner and you could just say, I would like to take advantage of some of the uh, aspects of this mixed use code. And I, I want to initiate that on my own. So there's different ways that that rezoning could be done. But again, that's a process. And that's a process that will involve the traditional recommendation by PNZ, the traditional decision by council. So none of that rezoning happens just by virtue of adoption of this code. All this does is expanding the tools that are on the table. So that's an important kind of uh, predicate for, for where we go. Now let's talk about what's in the ordinance itself. The mixed use code, um, uh, your staff came up with these kind of six uh, themes of describing how how the mixed use code uh, gets in some, some key important dynamics for Sugarland. I, I like this list. Ruth and I will walk through all of these with you. Provide a home for family nearby, walkable places for people, facilitate less driving, more living. That, that, that means reduced parking uh, for this ordinance. Respect adjacent neighborhoods, streamline and world award or innovative development, and accelerate redevelopment. So we've got a few slides just on each one of these. And I think these give you a helpful overview of, of, of some of the big ideas. So I'll take the first few. Provide a home nearby for family. So this is the theme that talks about different housing options. This is a big uh, uh, theme, obviously, of, of this effort. Um, the idea from the land use plan is that you want a diversity of housing options, which would provide places for you know, young professionals and families to set down roots and trigger them. Maybe some people would want to downsize. You know, I talked to someone last night that was very interested in downsizing from a single family detached into an attached home, but had a hard time finding that particular product in Sugarland that met their, their particular goals. Um, businesses within the activity centers really need those rooftops to help provide the customers, you know, for those, for the, for the businesses, the non-residential that comes into those areas. Um, 
the mixed use districts are intended to be of some, a, a tool to allow those residential units to be located in activity centers and integrated with non-residential. Again, y'all are doing mixed use now. You've gotten some good examples of it, but you've done it through the plan development process. And this is an opportunity to create it in a more simple way uh, to a more predictable standard. Oops. Um, you know, a home nearby for family, that might be different types of homes than you have now. And so one of the things, one of the tools that we're introducing is this idea of middle housing. And some communities say that, you know, we've, we've forgotten about these, these you know, duplexes and triplexes and quadplexes. And so you get this term missing middle. You know, people say it's missing from zoning codes because they've forgotten, you know, that, that these are important uh, product types. You know, back in the 20s, 30s, you know, in my neighborhood in Denver, you know, these were very common. But you don't see them as much today. The zoning codes have gotten away from the, the, the duplexes and the fourplexes, et cetera. So one of the things that the ordinance proposes is changing the definition of multifamily. Right now it's five units plus, and the ordinance as drafted would change the definition of multifamily to seven plus. And so everything that you see on this slide is, is, is below seven, so up to the six plus. And so if, when, when we refer to missing middle housing, these would be below seven units. Now the one on the left-hand side, cottage court, um, you see those around Texas. I've seen them in places like McKinney. Um, I think you've got them in Richland nearby, Richmond. Um, that's something that will be new that will be proposed in the ordinance. I did want to flag that there's an error in the draft. And the definition of cottage court right now does suggest that you could have buildings um, uh, that, that, uh, primary, that formerly had been mobile homes or something. And that was an error. And that, that's not intended for those. those. Those are intended to be structures that meet the building code. So I just want to clarify that. But um, that's the missing middle. That's that's one type of the housing options. But the, the mixed use districts, as they're drafted, anything over um, five acres would have to have at least a couple of different housing types. And so it could be those missing middle housing types that were on the prior slide. Um, the point is that you want to proliferate, prevent a proliferation of just one housing type. You're trying to get a mix of housing options in all of these districts. So you've got a, um, a, a mixture of housing types required. You've also got a mixture required of non-residential uh, and there, with a mixed use requirement. So anything over two acres has to have a mix of residential and non-residential. Now let's talk about multifamily. Multifamily is part of the residential mix as well. You know, that could be uh, a type of, uh, of housing that, that is allowed in the land use plan. And so that is contemplated in this draft ordinance. The intent is that it be high quality. One of the ways that we've tried to get at that is by putting in what we call an amenity state. So this is a, a just part of it. So basically, uh, depending on the number of units uh, that you were putting into a multi-unit project, uh, a multi-family project, you'd have to accumulate a certain number of points to that uh, project. And the, the draft actually has a, a table that's got dozens of different options of amenities. It could be like improving the site area by providing some type of dog park or something, or they could be uh, doing some type of additional building enhancements, like you know, lead certification or uh, a, you know, green roof or something like that. There's dozens of different options, but the idea is that you need to raise the bar in some way. You as a developer have the choice of which of those options makes sense for you, but you got to raise the bar in some way. Um, in terms of the number of units, this is based on land use plan and, and the conversations with the task force. But for the mixed use neighborhood, the proposal is that just with the standard approval process, <clears throat> you could do the lesser of 150 units or three units per acre as, as specified in the NAC. For the re mixed use regional, it's lesser of 350 allowed by right where the maximum units per, as specified in the land use plan for that regional activity center. So um, you could you could potentially do more than that if you chose to apply for a conditional use permit. But the process is drafted is that the straightforward approval uh, would be a staff approval um, if you met all the higher quality standards in the code. Now Ruth's going to talk more about process later on in more detail. But the 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 general thrust right now is that if you do generally what's in keeping with the purpose of of the districts and in the standards and the in the plan, then that that would be a staff approval. Um, but that would be uh, if you go above and beyond that, you come up to council. One thing I just want to emphasize right up front 
is that the PNZ and the Council would have a very important role in this process in terms of establishing and adopting the standards up front. And so it's not an abdication of authority at all. It's saying that we are adopting these standards. We trust that these standards will result in quality development, and then we trust our staff to just implement our direction. When we had the conversations with the peer cities, that is something they stressed to us as an important step in the success of their programs. Plano talked about that. You know, it was important for us to invest in the quality standards up front, but then the staff came in and made those data data. Matt, could you please, could you repeat, repeat that, please, for one of the, one of the commission members, what you just said? Please. Yes, sir. Um, when uh, it, there is an important role uh, for the council and the commission to play, in the initial setting of the standards and ensuring that they're going to meet your quality that you expect for sure. But then the ultimate implementation of that on just a project by project basis would, would be for staff if the project, you know, fell within the thresholds that you had set. And then I said, if one of, that's a lesson that we really learned from the, the, the peer cities that we talked with is that they felt like it was important to go ahead and create a streamlined process uh, where they trusted the staff following the, the initial, um, uh, you know, adoption of the standards by the council. So, perfect. If we have questions, can we wait for Ruth to get the process part of it? You, you can, but I mean, if you've got a question right now that you think is better addressed, then I'm, I'm fine to... May I? Sure. Okay, this may be a Ruth question because it does have more to do with the process okay. than it does with what you're talking about. But can you better explain where we came up with 350 units? And if we're talking about that's a maximum unit per rack, is it per acres in a rack? Because if we're just putting 350 units in a rack, I can't believe we're just doing that in a 50-acre rack. So that's not what we're talking about. But that's what it looks like. I, I am going to let Ruth explain the origin of the 350 because I think that came up with conversations. With the sure. Right. So, um what we were looking for with the numbers was allowing um, a certain level of development by right um, that would follow all those requirements, as Ms. Matt talked about, um, without um, the extra steps required as we go through right now with the PD process. The number was based on, um, we, we threw out, I think, 300 initially as a starting point. And in further conversation with our development community, essentially they said that number just isn't going to work today in terms of the way that development works. Um, it has to be more like 350 or you might as well make it zero is essentially what, what we got from them. Um, in terms of your question about how that gets applied, it's, it's 350 per development application. And so then um, beyond that, it would be based on the rack. So if the rack had 400 max in the land use plan, then you could have three, 350 up to 350 in a specific project. And then you could potentially have a project of 50 additional in a separate project um, that would still be within that threshold of the, the activity center. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, I, I don't mean to be persistent, but I want to understand sure. for everyone listening to understand. Sure. So we're going to look at floor, which has 50 acres. Mm -hmm. And it's assumptive that we're only putting 350 units there. That is not true. How do we get to the real number that would be really looked at once we hand this over to staff? I mean, what's, what's feasible? No developer wants just 350 units in there. That's understandable. So what number would we look at reasonably? And at what point would it come to council or PNZ to say, hey, we've got to look at this and take it back to the public? So that would um, actually be through an amendment to the land use plan. Um, in that case, if you, um, assuming the Pearl moves forward and gets developed in that regional activity center is that very specific example. Um, if there was another development, another uh, multifamily developer for 350 units, then we would be looking to amend the land use plan. Um, and so that would be the public process that we would be going through through the Planning Zoning Commission and City Council to evaluate whether um, that's something that City Council wants to do. Is that helpful? Okay. Okay. Feel free to ask more questions as we get into the presentation. Uh, Ruth, let me, let me attempt to get at the issue that you're asking. The, the council is going to decide if one of these zoning de designations gets overlaid over that land. Right. So it, it doesn't just 
because it's a RAC or an act, right. it doesn't automatically attract one of these zoning designations. That has to go through the very public process of going through PNC and going through the city council and the city council deciding to adopt one of these additional zoning categories. I mean, it's still as part of the, if you, if you, if you look at the art, article two, plan development process, which is what we use now, what we were using when I was chair of PNC in 2000, is still part of that. What we're doing with Imperial is part of the PD plan development process. A developer could certainly decide that, you know, I'm not interested in one of these additional zoning units. I want to go through the PD process, the two-step process like we're doing in Imperial, which it requires a general plan and then a final development plan. They can certainly do that. Sure. Well, I see, I see all the reasons to make it a new zoning district for sure, because there's a lot of good stuff in this. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand if we do that because it has a lot of benefits, how does the process work and what we can expect? And I'm trying to be understanding of what it looks like once exactly. that happens and it's in place. Sure, sure. And I will get into that a little bit more in the, the process part. So maybe that'll help. I've got a little bit of a diagram that I'm hoping maybe helps with some of those questions too. All right. Uh, that might be our last slide on housing for this piece. Um, yeah. So the next theme we wanted to talk about is walkability. Um, you know, one of the key things that's emphasized in the land use plan is that mixed use districts are places where walkable urbanism is important, and walkability. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is some of the language from our plan. Create places focused on people instead of, pe instead of vehicles. Cars are not evil. But we're trying to create places that you do have a, more of an emphasis on pedestrian friendliness. And, and it's not just de designed around the car, uh, even though it's hot in, in, in Sugar Land. You know, there are times when you want to have a little bit of an opportunity to walk, you know, to a place where you're going as, to, as opposed to always drive. Um, so establishing lot and building and site design standards that are all tailored for the, for the, for the intensities and the characters, the rack versus next. But are, but are pedestrian friendly. And I'll, I'll give you some illustrations of what we mean by that. Um, this is right outside. But this is an example of creating the type of walkable, uh, pedestrian friendly place that these standards ultimately are intended to try to achieve in, in more places, uh, not just in town center. Uh, you've got you know, first floor retail with residential above. Uh, you've got trees on the walkways to help provide shade you know, where, where sidewalks are provided. Um, you've got, you know, high quality sight lines uh, for, for visibility, for, for, for safety. Um, you've got thoughtful building design that help create some of these outdoor rooms. Y'all have an outstanding example of this type of site design uh, right outside. And there's ways the town center can be improved, I think. But in terms of just the design aspects of it, it's, it's a really outstanding place. Um, and just some of the other things that you see highlighted. And so in terms of a code, that, that translates into... Um, I thought I had another, I was going to go to that. that. That translates into, you know, looking at uh, street design and looking how streets and sidewalks relate to the building placement and making sure that buildings are brought up to the sidewalk and making sure that when you have sidewalks, you've got a clear zone for people to walk and you've also got pedestrian enhancement zones where you've got things like bike racks or you've got things like uh, the trees as well. And so this is the kind of thing that you don't just get unless you require it require it. And so the, the code is trying to provide some more predictability and ensuring you've got these high quality pedestrian spaces uh, along the streets in the mixed use areas. And so um, these are just some terms that are that are used in the code to describe these areas. The, the pedestrian enhancement zone and the clear zone collectively are referred to the pedestrian realm. And this is more than what you would get in Sugarland otherwise. You know, otherwise in Sugarland you might just get five, you know, maybe a little bit more in terms of a sidewalk, but you wouldn't be getting the, the enhancements that are required here. And then I, I skipped one slide. I, I, this is just the, the idea of this, um, the, 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 uh, the residential and the, and the, and the non-residential being mixed. Um, there's, a, there's a table that has the, the mixture of residential and non-residential uh, that's required. Um, some of the key points there are it only starts over two acres and uh, there's different uh, percentages required for different amounts. We actually had a good conversation about this with the developer roundtable yesterday, and we may have introduced a little bit more complexity uh, in this mixing uh, than is ultimately worth the value of, of the headache of administering it. 
And so this is a good example of this. This could be fine tuned and simplified in the new code. But I think that mixture of uses is an important part of that walkability conversation. Yeah, uh, Matt, hold on just a minute, Carol. Yeah, yeah. So I have a question about that. Does this go back to the other slide? Okay. So, um, so yes, and this applies to those um, NAS and wraps. And an example that we saw, um, I'll highlight that one of the NAS had about 142 acres in it. And it's probably, I mean, it has probably over a dozen different parcels. Mm -hmm. And so, and we were told that it would apply to each one of these parcels. And to, for, and, you know, some of them were two acres, some of them were five acres, some were three acres, seven acres. I mean, so based on this table, in one net, you could have, um, Maybe a dozen different residential developments, you know, because I wanted each parcel. Mm -hmm. And that just seems like that just can end up with a, a, a hot, I mean, 14 different residential, separate residential developments in one map. It seems like it just can end up with a hot spot yeah. or something. So I'm really concerned about the table. Well, and I think that that is why we started to talk about simplifying it moving forward. But um, the idea is that every development, coming in of some scale needs to be thinking about that mixed use question and how are you going to have both residential and non-residential components. And I think a lot of the places we talked to um, saw that hodgepodge, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing, you know, maybe as bringing a lot of variety and a lot of options into some of these mixed use environments. And so I, I just make that point. We also um, introduced some language in the draft that says that um, in some situations, you can look at what's out, immediately outside um, the, the activity center as part of those calculations. And so if you've, say, for example, if you've already got a lot of non-residential right outside a NAC, then maybe that could count towards your, your percentage of non-residential, and you could do more residential within that NAC. So I, I, we, we've, we recognize that context is important in these, in these questions of mix. And so we tried to introduce some more flexibility there. So Matt, the, 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 both the PNC members and the city council members had a lot of discussion around this. You know, I think what brought it to everyone's attention was the fact that, let's, in Carol's example, let's say you got a dozen landowners and, you know, 10 of them are making pretty good money. Mm -hmm. They're flipping coupons. They've got no incentive to actually take what is a, is a degrading property and, and do something else and redevelop it or uh, upgrade it is a better better term. And we recognize back to the original comment that, that was made that there would have to probably be incentives, just like we're doing right now, residential yeah. properties, in order to get people to upgrade, you know, their exteriors and to provide some incentive to get them to do that. Otherwise, you know, your your properties continue to uh, degrade. It doesn't mean they devalue. Yeah. But I know we've got several neighborhoods right now, uh, which we have a lot more. We have a lot more citations now than we've ever had in the city of Sugar Land. I've been around here since 1990, actually since 1980, when my in-laws moved in into Sugar Land. And it's it's true, our housing stock and our commercial stock are aging. And the question that the council has faced and what caused this direction was, how do we how do we jumpstart our commercial and our residential owners to, the, to where they're willing to reinvest in those properties and take it to the next level as, a, as, a, as opposed to continue on a decline curve. Yeah. Well, and I think that proactive rezoning that we talked about up front, um, accompanied with those incentives that you mentioned, can be really effective ways to jumpstart Mayor. that dynamic. Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Just a point of clarification. Are, are, we, are we talking about these zoning districts applying to parcels or to the entirety of these snacks and racks? Both the, the, the latter, ultimately. But I mean, it might start individually with, with just individual parcels. You know, it, maybe if some, maybe if, if, if an individual landowner wanted to come in with a parcel in one of these areas where the city wasn't, wasn't immediately moving. Probably if they had a big enough parcel, yeah. I can't, having been a developer, I can't see that a two or a five acre developer is going to apply for this kind of zoning. He's probably going to go through the PD process. But it's an available tool. But it, but it would be a tool that the incentive, I think, is trying to get, you know, those 12 landowners to get together and say, hey, you know, there might be some value, might be some additional value to all of us if we get together, apply for this, mm -hmm. and then have this this overall upgrade to the entire area. Yeah. 
we're not, you know, I, th I think what's what's clear to me from the discussions we've had and and from being a developer myself, we're not going to get this thing right the first time. And we heard that from Plano. We've heard that from Frisco. We've heard that from everybody. Yeah. We're going to get 80% and then we're going to have to work to get the other 20%. And it's, it's going to, it's going to be a slow, you know, I think there's some, there's some question right now that we're moving pretty fast. Not really. This has been going on for two years and, and we've, we've attempted, uh, clearly not done as good a job as we could have because some people were surprised. We've been having this discuss discussion yeah. early in 2022. Heck, I brought it up when I became elected in 2012. Redevelopment was one of the things that that I said needed to be addressed if this city was going to continue on some kind of a growth curve. So it shouldn't be a surprise. And effective redevelopment is always going to be incremental. Right. It's never going to be overnight. Good comments. Um, let me move ahead. Um, oh, I, you know, there, there was one of these option tables on the uh, on the pedestrian realm uh, piece that I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is build in flexibility, build in options for how people meet these higher quality standards. And in terms of meeting <clears throat> these higher quality pedestrian realms, you know, there's different things that a that a, that a developer can do, different ways to, to earn points. Um, that, that again, that they think makes sense for their site and for their particular project. We have we have one of these types of uh, tables for the multifamily as well. That's what I mentioned with that multifamily amenity table earlier. Um, you know, just more about the walkability. I think you know some of the walkability is not just the sidewalk, but it's the way the building is designed. You know, some of the things that we've tried to introduce are you can't have these real super blocks that keep people from, you know, moving between a block. You have to you have to have mid block pedestrian connections that let people you know, move from, uh, you know, side to side uh, in terms of the block width. Uh, we've got standards that look at grade level design, making sure that buildings have awnings, canopies, et cetera, to, to, sh to shade, shade the entrances. You've got uh, standards that require ground level floor activation of the of the buildings as well. So again, just a variety of things to try to make sure that you're doing high quality spaces that really you know are are focused on the pedestrian and making sure that they're they're, they're walker friendly. All right. Next one I'll talk about. A uh, last one for me is is the driving piece, and um, you know one of the things that we heard a lot from the stakeholders is that Sugarland already citywide has pretty high minimum parking standards for all development. Y'all's Yell, parking standards are high. They're 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 older and they're time for a a refresh, I think, based on what a lot of communities are seeing around Texas and around the country. Um, typical suburban development has a lot of space given to unused parking spaces, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of asphalt out there, um, which is very costly to develop up front. And it's, it's costly in terms of missed opportunity costs. Um, we have an opportunity with these mixed use districts to right size your parking requirements, at least in these targeted areas. And think about more again, you know, pedestrian oriented spaces versus cars. So the particular proposal uh, here in this ordinance is that in the mixed use districts, once they're applied, the, the minimum parking requirements would, would be reduced by 25%. So just right off the bat. Um, we also, in addition to that, have provided some additional reductions that you could get if you did things like shared parking, or if you did parking garages, structured parking, or or allowed your on-street parking to count. Again, um, there's a variety of tools that are in there. You could take advantage of more than one of those. If you did those, you could potentially reduce your parking by up to 60% of the minimum requirements. So um, I think there's 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 still parking required. We didn't move all the way from that, all, all the way away from that, like some cities have done, but it's, it's a lot more flexible uh, in terms of how you provide those spaces. We've gotten very good feedback on that piece in particular um, from, uh, especially the developers uh, who who recognize you know the market demands of their project uh, and and how much parking is really needed. These are minimums; these are not maximums. So, if an applicant you know wanted to provide more parking, then they they thought that their project you know needed that for some reason. They still could do that. This is just saying how much is, is Sugarland requiring as a minimum. Good. 
So you have to see what yeah, we can reduce parking and shopping. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little bit concerned about parking for multi family because you could have you know, one bedroom apartment, and there could be three cars. You know, a, a small car for each of them, uh, and then like a larger SUV or, you know, a front of front of just one span. And I know these ones are the uh, the Earl TV is just great. I have to have these back in the front. And they said they should be sort of standard. Um, you know, they need to mind it. Just, oh, it's fine. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, so. So I guess I'm concerned that we might overly reduce the parking in the um, in the in the multi-family. Mm -hmm. So uh, where did the 25 percent, the flat 25 percent, that exact percentage come from? How do you know if it wouldn't be better at 12 percent or 15 percent? Um, you know, it's for, just for multi-family. It's a it's a it's a fairly common practice in these types of ordinances. Uh, uh, I couldn't tell you it was mathematically you know, determined based on the Sugarland market. We did not do that. Uh, but it's certainly you know, not uncommon uh, in ordinances uh, where you've got high levels of um, potential transit or potential walkability. That's 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 a starting point for communities that that, that change their zoning requirements. Some places go farther, you know, and we've seen a lot of cities that have gone away from requiring minimum parking altogether. Uh, there's cities, and I know. I know Buffalo is not a good comparison to Sugarland, but Buffalo, New York, is a, is a one of the famous examples where they got rid of minimum parking altogether. Um, a lot of cities have moved away from requiring minimum parking at all in their downtowns. They just got rid of it altogether. So, when we were starting to have this conversation here, we you know floated ideas from other places, and we heard that's that's probably a bridge too far for us right now in Sugarland. And so we proposed something that we thought was you know a modest reduction, twenty five percent. Coupled with those additional reductions that you could get, yeah, so, it could go up to sixty percent, which is pretty. Up to sixty. That's pretty dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Question. If we are looking at reducing parking, are we looking at increasing green space? We are. There are some open space requirements uh, in here. Uh, for, for example, I think some of the uh, the cottage court uh, units have certain X amount of open space that's required. I, I think ultimately, though, the intent is that the the mixed use uh, developments would would uh, also have you know some public park space. I think that's my last slide on parking. Oh no, I, I did have one. Uh, just beyond just the required amount of parking, thinking about where parking goes. Uh, the standards talk about uh, you know needing to locate your parking to the side or the rear of buildings. Um, or, or, you know, potentially having some of it, uh, you know, angled like you have down in town square right now in the front. But that, that idea of parking not being the visual focus of the development and putting it to the side or to the rear of buildings is another important part of that just walkable environment. Um, there is a proposal also for surface parking areas to, have to be a maximum of 40% of your total lot area. Uh, and that, that will be new for Sugarland as well, just to make sure, again, that those sites are not dominated by park supplies. All right, I think that's my last slide on parking. It is. So that's, we've got through the first half of our themes. So we now we- follow up, follow up well, Okay, so, uh, you know, structure parking is required for multifamily in the land use plan. And so this, and so is, and this is, we're still requiring structure parking for multifamily here. Believe because I see a big push on uh, the, the, on, you know, the, the 40% of the on, on parking lot size. But are we still requiring this structured uh, parking for multifamily at this time? So the answer is yes. And I, I, I've got mine marked up and I did not see that. In and that, that, I didn't see it. So but it is, it, yeah. in all the comments we've had, any multifamily require structured parking. Yeah, it what, needs to be specifically written in. There. Yeah, what page is that so, written on in this document? I it's, guess it's a better question. Right, it's not because we recognize that there could be smaller, um, like especially in the neighborhood activity center, smaller unit areas where that wouldn't necessarily make sense, where it wouldn't um, make financial sense to do a structured parking garage for a small number of units. And so that's why we took more the approach of um, the maximum percentage of your lot that can be um, parking, a surface parking of being 40%. And I think we also were looking at um, it being one of the incentive pieces where it was highly incentivized to do the structured parking, but not just flat required. I'm, I'm going to give you my opinion. It's flat required. Yes, and, I agree. And, and, yep. and if we want to separate 
I get what you're saying, Ruth, where, because I made this comment early on, and a multifamily, and I, you're not going to get many small multifamily, so I, I, I have a hard time seeing that. Multifamily requires structured parking, period. Now, if you've got some kind of a specialty project, I think the unit that's on then then that can be taken care of. But it needs to be written in here so it's clear to any multifamily development, it's structured parking or laying. Okay. But we will talk about the process later on, but one of the we're going to talk about this mixed use concept plan. And, and that's one of the reasons why you would need to do a concept plan is if you're proposing some kind of alternative. And so maybe if you're coming in with your 10 unit project and you didn't want to do structure parking, you'd have to ask for that. Before we do this, uh, let me, uh, we've had a request for a bathroom break. Why don't, why don't we take a brief recess and we'll convene back at uh, 745. Does that work for everybody? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't even think of it. But.
Thank you, Mayor. All right, so now we're gonna talk about respecting adjacent neighborhoods. Here we go. Um, so in the land use plan, it talks about mitigating and preventing impacts from development in activity centers on adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, it indicates that we should create appropriate transitions between single family neighborhoods and activity centers by establishing building, uh, varying building heights and building transition regulations. So doing more like what is on the right than what is on the left with buildings um, kind of stepping away, getting higher as they get further away from um, the residential. Um, so there are some specific standards in the code, um, in the draft code that would um, help to minimize these impacts including um, talking about the placement of windows, porches, balconies, and other outdoor living spaces, um, as well as limiting lo the location of off-street parking, loading, and service areas away from adjacent residential uses. Um, it also talks about requiring um, the height of buildings in mixed-use districts to gradually step down as they get closer to uh, residential zoning districts. Yeah. Okay, so what is the maximum building height that's a allowed in the uh, residential districts? Is it usually the same or does it vary from uh, neighborhood to neighborhood as uh, as discussed in items A and B? Sure, yeah. So most of our residential districts are a maximum of 35 feet. Um, I believe the hill is one exception. It's 27 feet, I want to say. Um, but most of them, I believe, are 35 feet. So the way that um, the code is drafted currently, if you are within, if you have a building within 50 feet of a residential district, then the maximum height of that building would be the same as what is in um, the adjacent residential district. And then as you get further away, more height can be added um, up to the point where once you are 250 feet away, then you can get up to the maximum height that's allowed in the, the mixed use zoning district. Um, also just wanted to be clear, um, that this could happen gradually. So it's not to say that you're always gonna have a space between a six story building and the residential, um, that all of these buildings could actually be in between here, um, between this building and the, the residential district, Ruth, kind of stepping push, up and back. Uh -huh. Sorry, I think you probably already answered this, but this to piggyback on Carol's. Topic. Okay. So instead of having a max flat height across the city, it's now gonna be relative, the maximum heights relative to what its nearest development height is, or is, is is that the correct interpretation, or is that? Um, I'm trying to think how to respond to that. So the existing districts do have maximum heights, and they vary um, in the commercial districts. Um, and it, it, but there are also limitations based on their proximity to residential. If you're familiar with the bulk plane, that's what we use today. This just functions a little bit differently and we feel like it will be um, more effective in getting the, the type of development in the way that it sort of interacts with the adjacent residential just makes a little bit more sense. Ruth, it could also vary based on the PD. I know where I am in Lake Point, it's different. Height, sure. It has a different height requirement. Sure. Based on a, a plan development, which is more what this mirrors. That's true. William. So this applies to parking garages also, the same height requirement? Yes. Okay. Any structure. Yeah. For example, you wouldn't have a parking garage outside of that, but it's closer to the home. Right. Some right. guy's looking over the parking no. garage. Hey, what are you doing? No, no. no okay. Okay. No, and ideally what we would like to see is that um, that missing middle housing could be the gap filler so that you know what is directly adjacent to the existing residential would be residential uses that's not guaranteed but ideally that's what we would like to see um so the next kind of theme that we want to talk about is streamlining and rewarding innovative development um so as um matt talked about earlier um, city council and planning and zoning commission will continue to have direction and oversight um, in our zoning processes. So first with this initial review and adoption of the higher quality standards for the mixed use districts. So that's literally what we're doing right now, the feedback you're providing right now and what gets adopted into the code over the next few months um, is, is, is your opportunity to provide that feedback. 
And then as we go through the rezoning process for particular pieces of property, those rezoning processes will still go through the public process of the Planning and Zoning Commission public hearing, City Council public hearing, and ultimately the, the City Council's decision. So the zoning does not get applied to any property without going through that additional process. Um, and just like we have with um, a number of really almost all of our other, well, all of our zoning districts just about, except for PDs, I guess, the standards that get adopted by city council are then implemented by staff. Staff is simply certifying that a project meets what's in the code. You establish the expectations for how something develops in the city through the code, and then we implement it. That happens every day with projects across the city. You have large projects like Methodist Hospital and all of its additions that have been developed through being zoned B2, they did not have to go through a special process that required, um, you know, extensive public input or, um, you know, unknowns that, that they know exactly going into it, owning that property, what can be expected of them. And so they have to submit their permits and their process um, to make sure that we make sure that they're meeting those, those zoning regulations as well as the building codes. Um, but again, we're certifying that it meets the codes that are established by city council. Um, and so all of these projects would still have to go through that standard process. They're gonna go through platting, they're gonna go through site plans, which is where we look at things like public infrastructure and the traffic mobility analysis, um, and then ultimately building permit review. Um, so all of those elements that we typically look at will continue to be evaluated to ensure that we have the high quality development here that we always have. Carol? So, you know, uh, if this goes through and if something is done, if this goes through and something's uh, re, you know rezoned to one of the mixed use districts, I mean, one of the objectives is to proactively uh, rezone. Mm -hmm. So then council's gonna be asked to rezone something uh, when there's even no developer in sight and we have no idea what it's gonna look like. And then that, at that point it is, yes, turned over completely to staff for staff to um, review and uh, approve as long as it's not more than 350 apartments in Iraq or 150 apartments in a net uh, subject to the other, you know, land use plan uh, terms. So I mean, how can we have confidence in, um, you know, proactively approving this when we have no idea in some cases what a, a future developer is going to bring to that site? Because you know that if you believe in the standards that are established, that you're going to get the kind of quality development that you believe is appropriate here in Sugarland. Again, just like we do in other places, and, and you're absolutely right, when a property gets rezoned, it could be, if it's the city initiating it, we, like you said, obviously don't know what project may come forward in the future, but in the same way, a property owner could come forward and say, I want to go ahead and put this mixed use zoning on my property. I don't know what I want to do yet. I just want to be ready when somebody comes forward and is, is ready to partner with me to redevelop, or, you know, I just want to be able to take advantage of, um, you know, the new zoning district. And so, um, again, that's why we have what we kind of call front loaded the code with some pretty significant standards to ensure that quality development takes place um, because there's certainty in the standards that are established in the code. You know, Ruth, we also, you know, going back, even on a city initiated rezoning, mm -hmm. council makes the ultimate decision whether sure. to move forward. It's not a staff decision. That's right. You know, sir, you had a question. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Ruth, I just want to consolidate something, please. Every communication that I've had from constituents, uh, particularly those who attended last night, and everyone, uh, almost everyone who's spoken today uh, has uh, emphasized their concern about Council and Planning and Zoning Commission uh, giving up our elect, you know, uh, elected duty to approve development. So I want to repeat what I heard and you tell me if I'm on if I'm on on track. Okay. What you're saying is that this document which by the way I would love to take a big old magic marker too which is fine I presume, right? Mm -hmm. Uh is going to be if we approve any of it is going to be applied to specific geographic areas, racks and nacks specifically and that we are going to, as a council, approve specific uses with specific uh, requirements of, for those uses. And 
staff is not intending to approve or disapprove. Staff is only uh, going to find uh, going to decide whether the proposal is meets the criteria set out. And the thing that triggered it in my head was when you said Methodist Hospital. Mm -hmm. Council set out what a B2 is, uh, the specifications for a B2. All staff did was say, yes, this meets council's uh, instructions. Mm -hmm. So we're not abdicating. Now, if somebody wants to propose something that is outside the guidelines of the marked up thing that we eventually adopted, mm -hmm. we do, mm -hmm. um, then we have to go through the whole typical PD process with the general and the final and all that, depending on what it is. Does it, do I have that right? Yes, just one point of clarification. I okay. um, just want to repeat that when we, if and when this code gets adopted, incorporated into the development code, I'll say it's just a piece of the development code. So it fits into a larger picture, which may or may not be clear. Um, this is just a piece. Um, it doesn't actually apply the zoning to any particular property right away. We still have to go through a separate process to rezone properties. Now, what the land use plan says is, hey, there's these racks and there's these knacks, and this is where you should be looking to apply the mixed use zoning. And so that's our guidance for when we bring it back to you and say, this property owner is requesting rezoning, or we're saying, we think this is a good place to start for rezoning. And this is why, because the land use plan says this is a good place for mixed use. Um, and so that would be one clarification I would say, but yes, you're right. That that's that's exactly right. We through this code, we establish what uses are allowed there and what are not, what requires a conditional use permit and what does not. Um, it, it it sets out um, the other standards that Matt went through in terms of the walkable walkability and parking and all of that. Um, so that everybody knows up front what kind of quality development to expect when something does come through and staff is reviewing it to certify that it meets the requirements established by council. So in a way, this is no different than what our foremothers and forefathers did decades ago when we originally uh, created zoning in Sugar Land. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Right, it's a very typical zoning process. And I think what is um, maybe some discomfort that we're feeling is that we've gotten really used to using PDs here in Sugarland, And this is very common for cities where um, as you evolve, expectations change. And maybe maybe what we really should have done about 10 or 15 years ago was relook at the development code and say, what are we not getting that we should be getting out of our standard districts? But instead what we did was say, Everybody just needs to go through the PD. And so that's what you as P and Z and council and the public is, has become accustomed to is looking at those very specific project site by site, um, you know, um, applications in particular areas of the city, which happen to be the areas that are largely the ones that have developed over the last 10 years, Telfair, Imperial. Um, but in the rest of the city, we've had tons of development take place in the business park in First Colony. Those are not PDs, and they're happening through this exact process that we are um, oh, looking to do for the mixed-use districts as well. Okay, so the only thing really to fight about is what we're going to allow in each of these spaces. Right? Yes, That's sir. what we're fighting about. Yes, sir. what we're going to fight about at some point. We're going to have a, a great conversation about it. We're going to torture this <laughs> thing within an inch of its life until, we, until it's exactly what our residents need and want. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Here, go ahead. Ruth, I, 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 to follow up on Stuart's point, which is a really good one, by the way, uh, the document has a lot of great stuff in it, but some of the feedback I'm getting is the communication with the public. Mm -hmm. So while we are comfortable with this, or where you may be comfortable or not, I, I've been on PNZ, I know how the process works, we know what's going in, we know what it may look like. But the general public doesn't. Sure. Because I live over here, I'm doing my stuff, and all of a sudden, boom, here's something. The engagement part and mm -hmm. feedback is essential to our constituents. Mm -hmm. This is their city. This is their tax money. They want to know what's happening. Sure. And we don't want to have a hosting of a public meeting where they get no input sure. or where they get a presentation and no opportunity to get feedback, give feedback, and be heard. Here's the question. If a developer comes in and has a, a meeting, is it even essential? Do they get heard or is it just something to have them there and just act like they heard them. 
So that's a great question. And actually, it's a perfect segue into my next slide. So, um, look, so Ruth, part, before you go into that yes, slide, so I'm going to follow up on something Stuart said. So the intent with a PD process right now, we go through a general plan. Public has input in the general plan. We go through a final development plan. Public has input into that. Mm -hmm. The same process exists for this rezoning. Staff will be able to take from, from the specifics of one of these zoning districts and say, these are the uses that are going to be in this mixed use neighborhood or regional district. These are the, these are the uses that are approved. If you want uses different than that, you go through a different process. You mm -hmm. go back through a PD process, or you go with some kind of a variance to the zoning category, which I tell you, that sends you right back to the PD process. Mm -hmm. Correct? Um, yes. Generally, yes. Yes, I that's want, what... I don't want generally, okay. yes. I'm that's, that is... That is yes what, or no. Yes, that's what we're doing here, is establishing the uses that would be permitted in these districts. Um, we want to get it as right as we can so that we're not... Um, encouraging or forcing people to go through the PD process again, because that's what we're trying to get away from. Um, but also recognizing that this is going to be the first stab at it. I mean, this is, I think, I feel like really good work that we've done and um, evaluating other communities and talking to other communities about um, their experiences with mixed use. Um, but we also know that every code is different and every community is different. And so we're going to have to look at this again in the future. We know it's not going to be 100% right. And it's it's even if we got it perfect this time in a year or two or three or four or five, something will change that will have to change. It's It's got to be a living document. And so I think it's really important for us as staff to recognize that and for everyone to recognize that a code is never intended to be etched in stone and never changed. It evolves and it, it has to be reflective of what's happening in the market and um, just in, in the world at any given time. Yeah, girl. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, just a couple people have mentioned the PD process. And so just want to clarify or point out that if there's any remote way possible that this can fit into a mixed use zoning district, the PD process is not available. Because like the way they talked to about us previously is like, yeah, the developer can go through the PD process or you can go through the mixed use process. But the way this is written, um, you cannot go through the PD process if there's any way that it would fit into a mixed use zoning. And and even then, it would have to be approved by the director. So the PD process is you know, not going to be eliminated, but pretty only reason extremely rare circumstances. I'm not sure I follow you. Yeah. Page 64. So, so what's your, so let me, let me back up. So you got a piece of land, you got a rack or an act that hasn't gone through this process. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that that can't go through the PD process. It says unless the direct, unless the proposed project is not feasible using the MUN or MUR based zoning districts and the director determines that. And then that's the only way it can be resigned to a PD. That assumes, though, that it is already zoned to this district. It's zoned to anything. Um, yeah. Well, there's you've got so let's the racks and next right. I'll, now I'll let don't Ruth, have, I'll let Ruth explain yeah. that. Wait, Ruth, explain page sixty four yeah, then, or somebody explain page sixty four. Sure, I'll just jump in there. Um, so there was there was two parts of the uh, equation here. One part was making it really easy to develop in the mixed use districts. That was to encourage development there. But the other part, part was trying to make it a little more challenging to do a PD in, this, in these areas. We wanted to ratchet back on that tool. And so one of the things that we did in addition to drafting the mixed use districts was to put some additional standards in for PD and to try to raise the bar there and say you shouldn't be doing PDs as often in these areas. And so that's what that language on 64 reflects. And so uh, it's come up a couple of times, what happens if I can't meet the standards in the mixed use districts? What's my option? You do have like the standard variance that's still out there, but the the intent here, there's a new tool, this mixed use concept plan, and that's intended to be a new thing that y'all don't have now. And if I'm coming in to do a mixed use district that's phased or it's over 10 acres, or if I'm seeking some kind of flexibility from the standards in this code, then I have to go through this mixed use concept plan. And the intent there is that's gonna be an additional process that you have to go through. It still ultimately is a, is a director decision, but it's gonna it's gonna have a higher threshold. Who is the director? Director is, is planning director. So 
but that's 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 a tool that's in here. That, that's the that's the intended tool for alternatives from the, the mixed use standards. I just want to clarify that. Go ahead. So just just to be Matt. clear, in response to the colloquy between Carol and the mayor, if if you have a property that's already zoned to one of the mixed use zoning designations, then you can't you don't have the tool of using the plan development within that district. That's what I have how I read this. It's a higher threshold. You still could, but you, you'd have a higher threshold. If the so and the threshold is what's under sub point A of 2 132. Yes. I think that's right. Or B or C. So those would be the way yeah, it's not feasible. Them. Yeah. Okay. But you would still okay, I'm not gonna ask that next question right now. That's it. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna but this, <laughs> I, I would circle this back to the example that we had on the structured parking. And so there's, you know, as we've discussed, there, there would be a requirement for all multifamily to have structured parking, period. So that'd be a standard. But then if somebody said, well, hey, I'm doing this 10 unit multifamily project and I, it's not feasible for me to do multifamily, the, the way this draft would allow for that flexibility is for them to say, I want to do a mixed use concept plan where I ask for flexibility from one of those. Where I ask for a variance. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of the mixed use version of a variance. Yeah. Well, and that actually, if I may, okay. that actually is my question. But you can you see, you can't use a PD, but you could, could you still, would there be a CUP process? Is that how you would get a variance or no? No, uh, the C, uh, conditional use permit is really for um, when you look at the, the land use table, it specifically says which uses require or allow by right require a CUP or not allowed at all. And the conditional use permit is really asking the question, is this use appropriate in this particular place? Or is this size of this use appropriate in this particular place? And if 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 it is, but it's it's gonna, there's something that needs to be mitigated, then it allows you to mitigate negative impacts that can be caused by that particular use in that particular location. Okay, and but for this, you wouldn't necessarily have any standards. It would just be case by case. For a CUP? For a variance. Mixed use concept. Oh, um, mixed concept. Use plan. Um, ask the question again. I'm sorry. Well, to, to your point, in the existing definition of a CUP, you've got you've got some uses that are permitted, and you've got some that are identified that are going to require we're we're saying this colloquially, a variance. What I'm saying is in this process, those are not predefined in advance. Mm -hmm. So there are so some, you just if you want a variance from whatever is in this code section, it's going to be case by case to ask for it and it's for that to be there, approved or not. There, it, it wouldn't be two uses. That, that's definitely it would be an exclusion of like I want to add this use. I can go through the mixed use concept plan, but that would not be a process. Right, but to use the example of structured parking. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And so there would be some criteria that apply to that mixed use concept plan. And it's, you know, adverse impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods and consistency with the purpose statements of the of the district and those types of things. Um, but the other thing that is required for the mixed use concept plan is this citizen meeting that you have to have. So if, if you're if you're in this mixed use concept plan box, you have to go out and meet with the public um, after you submit your application before you uh, before you get approval. So that that's another considered to be another check. So who does it? So who does the approval? It's still drafted as the director right now for the mixed use concept plan, and that's that's something that's that's evolved through the drafting process. And earlier in the drafting process, the mixed use concept plan was uh, commission and council, and uh, through conversations and through a focus on streamlining, the current draft has that as a director decision. I agree. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, that's not going to happen. It's not going to be a director decision. Yep. That's good feedback. All right. Um, so, as we talked about with the mixed use concept plan, whether it's, I think, a staff decision or a council and PNZ review. Um, part of what we are looking to do is add a requirement for engaging the public early in the process instead of just what we typically do right now with a plan development, for example, which, which is what we're accustomed to, um, having the public hearings, which are kind of later in the process. Um, 
And so this would be an opportunity for a developer to have two-way communication between the developer or the applicant and the community. Um, right now, as you know, the community comes and talks and there's not even really opportunity for two-way dialogue between the community and the decision makers, just the way that it's structured. Um, it's, it's not ideal for, for input. And so um, that is a um, revision or a, an additional element. Um, thoughts on it? Okay. Yes. But even right now, though, I mean, even though it's not required right now, I mean, it still can be done. I mean, it was done with Lake Point Charles. Sure. I mean, they took it upon themselves to go out and hold a couple of residence meetings, sure. and then there were some changes to the PD. They had another resident meeting. So, I mean, I mean so it's being done yeah. now. So it's not that it can't be done now. It's just we can't require it because we have nothing that says they have to do it. And so what this would do is require it for any process that, or any application that's going through that mixed-use concept plan. Um, but it's not, if it doesn't, if it's done under the mixed, the standard mixed use zoning activity center, it does not, if that's not required? Correct. It would just be for anything that would fall in with the mixed use concept plan um, process. Okay. So the public wouldn't have any direct input then in that scenario. Right. Not on a particular project, because again, we have the, the code, which is um, looking at the, you know, it's developing those standards right now. The input would be at the front end when you decide to rezone right. that property to this kind of a designation, which establishes the criteria for that particular development. Mm -hmm. So the public, the public still has a chance to comment. It's at the front end before it's rezoned. Right. Which is the same way that we do it right now. That's right. That's how it is with all of the other zoning districts. Um, so thinking about streamlining and rewarding innovative development, why do we need to do this? Again, kind of going back to the idea, idea that we're not seen very favorably by the development community. Our processes are seen as overly burdensome and costly. Um, and so streamlining our development process is really critical to changing that perception. Um, that's, that's why we made that change to have the mixed use concept plan be a staff reviewed um, process instead of a um, planning and zoning and city council because when you add those two bodies, you have literally added months to the process. And so I just um, encourage you to keep that in mind. I, I hear you and I hear the hesitation in um, not having that be reviewed. Um, but when you, um, this is the, the, the timeframes and the processes as we envision in the, in the draft, um, so in comparing it to the current PD process, because that's what everybody kind of is conjuring in terms of how development works right now, um, we would typically have a pre-development meeting, but that's optional. Um, the, the application comes forward, staff does review, the applicant makes revisions. After there's been some back and forth, often multiple back and forth with staff, um, then we have the planning and planning and zoning commission public hearing and recommendation. Um, so that's really the first opportunity that the public has to see and hear about um, the application. And then um, it goes to the city council for the, the public hearing and, and um, consideration. This process often takes nine to 12 months, which is just not feasible in the development timeline. Um, and so that's why we had proposed the mixed use concept plan process where we would start with a pre-development meeting, which we would actually require to make sure that um, they understand the requirements of the code. We know that it's complicated. And so we want to make sure that there's an opportunity for a conversation with the developer. Um, and then right after that is when they would go ahead and hold a community meeting um, where they would share with the community what their, their draft plan is and can hear from the community early on in their development process so that they can make changes based on what they hear from the community. And then... Yeah, well, I've got Stuart and then I'll come to you. Um, and then that's at that point where they would officially submit their application um, staff would review, the applicant would make revisions, and then um, ultimately staff would approve. In this um, in this timeline, we would be looking at a 45 to 90 day timeline for going through the mixed use concept plan, um, which we believe is more in alignment with the, the real estate timeline of um, getting property under contract and having that certainty that um, developers are looking for in coming out of kind of that initial process. Um, when you Again, when you when you add that uncertainty and that unpredictability to the process um, and that that timeline, then then you're you're just adding a lot of uncertainty. And so we may find ourselves in a, in the same situation um, where we're not getting the kind of um, development that that we want to see. Sure. Thanks, uh, Ruth. This is uh, tiny, but it's but it makes a huge impact. 
staff approval. That's not staff approval. Staff's not approving anything. Staff is certifying right. that the proposal or whatever we're calling it, the development, meets the criteria set out by council. Right. All you're doing is certifying what we decided is okay for that particular. So that is huge. When Good people point. are reading this, I would suggest we change that to certification. Okay. Carol. Yeah. No, Suzanne. Oh, Suzanne. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just, this is a strange question, I do believe, but uh, it occurred to me that once we look at doing this, we may have multiple developers coming from the same property. So who does oversight looking at these and what's the criteria for choosing one developer over the other if we have multiple on one property? It would be the property owner that's responsible for that. I mean, they um, anyone that makes an application for any kind of development on a property has to have the property owner's sign off. They You can't just have a random person. I can't just go say, I'm going to submit an application for the property next door because I want to. It has to be in conjunction with the property owner, even if they're not the one if, you know, actually doing the development or initiating the development that whoever is applying is applying on their behalf. Okay. So we wouldn't have a, a, the, the Penn State having to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. You just approved that Lake Point project. Can you tell me the plan B by the Morgan right, Group? Uh, like, oh, like, sorry. We just approved that Lake Point project mm -hmm. by the Morgan Group recently on PNZ. Right. It worked really well, you know, with the. The process worked really well. I was just curious. There's no public outcry. Nothing mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. How many months did that take? Year. I was saying, I think it was probably about a year. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Maybe. I didn't know. That. I didn't, yeah. I just Certainly, as you get your I, I think so. Or were you telling no, us? No, I was just, I just saw that went really well. Everything was mm -hmm. perfect. The package was great. Nobody said anything because yeah. it fit with the neighborhood. I just, mm -hmm. and it, I just was curious. I thought it was like seven months, but yeah. Uh, was, see, yeah. Just a little more context. The, the developer uh, clearly told us the only reason why they stayed in it was the property owner was so accommodating, which typically isn't the case for a property owner to hold it that long without additional fees. So just gotcha. more context. Okay. Thank you. Here you go. I guess mine's sort of a two-part question. I don't know. Um, but also it's an accountability piece. So as it is now, um, council is accountable to the people. And so the people have all these questions. So I, I look at these two options here. And the way it is now, it's slow as molasses in the winter. I have no doubt about that. And I'm thankful for the, any developer that will sit through this process anyhow. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding something here. So I believe Stuart hit on it a moment ago. We as council, we know our community as best we can. Our community communicates with us regularly. We decide what this plan will look like. We do all the parameters and blah, blah, blah. We go through all the details of what our community will accept. And this second option here, we put that into place, into motion, okay? And so this developer comes along and wants to have this pre-development meeting with the community. The community comes out and says, we don't like this. We don't like the color of the brick, whatever it is, it, it's their hang up, okay? Because council is no longer in that second plan because we put everything into motion. So the community doesn't like anything about it. What do you do next? Do you just look at the community and go, ah, learn to live with it. Council's get, council gave us a process. Mm -hmm. Or is there a pause? Is there, I, I don't know what happens after the community meeting because each one of us is going to be getting a phone call mm -hmm. saying, hey, yes, you put this into process. You put it in a process, they're going to steamroll this. They've already talked to us, but we don't feel like we have a voice. We don't know what we're going to do, and we're all going, hold on a minute. We did put this in a process. So what would we, what would be the response to them? Is there a pause? So I think it, what would be important is establishing up front the expectations of what can and can't be influenced through that sure. public process. Um, what is allowed in the code would be authorized for that development. Um, I think the kinds of things that could be influenced could be um, how buildings are situated on a site 
or exactly where the road connects to the adjacent property or things like that, that um, the, in, the, the community could have influence on. And I think the different communities do it differently. We have seen other um, cities that have this early review um, by the community and kind of how um, they respond to it. There are some that we've seen that, or a lot that we've seen, I think that require, you know, that the, the um, developer provide a summary of all of the, the comments and, and how they're responding or not responding to it. Um, Matt, I think you may have something to add to that. Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. Um, first of all, in that situation, you know, if you get really negative feedback from the public at that community meeting, you know, that response from the director then is to not certify that because that's not, not compatible with surrounding neighborhoods. So that's that's definitely one option in that scenario. But in some places, you know, um, that we have, you know, referral tools where the director could refer that on to the council or the commission and or both um, because, you know, this is a particularly hot one. You know, it's a, it's a really sensitive area. I think this needs to go upstairs. Um, or sometimes it also works in the reverse. A council member or a commission member could call it up and say, we want to be in the decision on this. So you could draft it so that the default is the director. The de default is that staff uh, referral, but the staff certification, but you have the option to kick it upstairs, basically in certain circumstances. So that's not the way this is drafted now, but we've done that same Yeah, okay. so I'm gonna go to Michelle and then I'll come back to Stuart. Michelle. Yeah. So I want to kind of go back a little bit. Since we've got this slide, I don't know if you can hear my uh, mic. I want to go back a little bit, okay. but with this slide up as well, it's important. Okay. If a piece of dirt is zoned office mm -hmm. and I'm a developer and I come in and I want to put multifamily on it, mm -hmm. does that mean that the process is I go through the first process there, the nine to 12 month to get it zoned? So, um, I mean, great question. Okay. Great question. So the difference there is... Um, the difference there is the difference between a PD and a standard rezoning. With a standard rezoning, the process is more like four to six months. Um, we can get it down to four um, because the application, applicant revisions part of it is essentially not, the revisions are non-existent because when you submit an application, you say, here's my whatever acres of property that I wanna rezone from office to mixed use, the end. There's no revisions to be made because there's no project being submitted alongside that. Whereas a PD requires drawing up of site plans and drafting of a code essentially, which by the way, there's not a lot of people out there who do that kind of work. So that's just, it's hard to find somebody. It's hard to get the people that get it right. And then we're back and forth with staff. No, that's not really what PNZ and council expect to see. This is, it needs to look more like this, or this is what's going to be responsive to the community. And so that's a lot of times where you get into that kind of black box that Matt was talking about, the uncertainty. So if you're rezoning to a standard district, you, you don't have that because the standards are already established right in the code, whether it's the B2 district or a mixed use district. Um, so you still have, you still do the public hearing and recommendation and the public hearing and the first reading and the second reading. Um, it's just that middle part that gets condensed. And then often with a, a um, standard rezoning, the time between PNC and council can also be condensed because again, it's just a yes or a no. It's not a yes with revisions, which those revisions take time when you're talking about a PD process. And to follow up on that is it will go through planning and zoning and city council approval. Yes, sir. Perfect. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, I have a question regarding when you say community meeting, is that with a community Stephanie, meeting? Stephanie, you're, you're back. Oh, she has it. She's okay. When you say community meeting, okay. is that community at large or where the NAC is or where the RAC is? But how many days between the pre-development and the community meeting and how would the community get notified? Great question. So um, transparency, we haven't fleshed all that out. We've been looking at what other communities do. And so some of the things that we've looked at is, mm -hmm. um, you know, a similar notification as what happens for a public hearing where, you know, properties within 200 feet and um, maybe the, you know, the nearby HOA is what, is what we do right now. HOA council members. Are... Right, right. Um, you know, we could set it up to say it has to go on the nearby community Facebook page or, you know, like there's a, there's a variety of different ways we could approach that. But the idea would be the, the, the property owners that are most impacted that are kind of in that most direct area. Um, and, and what we've kind of talked about is 
um, they would have to provide some notice to the the neighbors and to the city, you know, say two weeks notice before they have the meeting. So it's not like you say, hey, we're having a meeting tomorrow, come on out. You know, there, there's got to be some time there for people to plan to um, be available to participate. Um, but again, we're, we're looking at what other communities are doing. That's a new kind of element that we're introducing. Um, it, it may be that we have pieces of that in the code, but we're also looking at incorporating some of that into our development application handbook um, so that if there's tweaks we want to make over time, we can do that um, at, at the staff. Okay. Through the staff. And one more question. The pre-development meeting, that's with staff or mm -hmm. with city council? Um, that's with the staff. Yeah. So that's something that we do right now routinely for different projects, whether it's one acre or 50 acres. Um, a, a um, applicant will come in and say, this is what I want to do on this site. And we talk about, is the use allowed? You have to go through a special process. Um, what are the driveway the separation requirements? You know, we have engineering, fire department, all the different departments that review development applications are part of that conversation. So the developer can really get an understanding of what the expectations are on the site. Okay, so currently that was optional. Right. And that's why it was taking so long, one of the reasons. Um, I don't, I mean, it could be, it could, that I, I would say that's part of the reason some of them have taken so long is because they haven't taken advantage of the opportunity to kind of get that mm -hmm. heads up um, ahead of time. And so um, the process took a while. Thank you. Suzanne, I'm going to go to Carol. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I was, Matt, or where would you go? I'm very interested in what you were talking you, about as a, an option that's not in the book about community feedback and what we might do if there's negativity. You said the director might uh, not recommend it to go forward. We know now it's not just a director. We're going to look at something optional and just a director making unilateral decisions. But we don't need to do it at this moment. But can we get more information on what that community negative feedback might look like when it comes back to PNZ, council, or task force, uh, rather than uh, just assuming that it's going to move forward without any feedback or action? Sure, and, and just to be clear, I, I was I was saying there might be a referral process where the the director would use their <clears throat> judgment and say, "Wow, this is a hot one. Mm -hmm. You know, this this one probably needs to be decided by, at the council level." And and so uh, communities have uh, oftentimes given pretty broad discretion to the director to kick something upstairs. You know, in those circumstances, and then sometimes um, there will be a it, it, again, it works in the reverse way, and there might be a notice placed on your agendas of the different projects that have been going forward for these community meetings. And you might hear what, from one of your constituents that you really want to be involved in that. And so you say, hey, we actually want to pull that from a director decision and make that um, a council decision. So, it, you know, we, we always say try to be cautious on that because you don't want that to become standard practice and you automatically just fall back into the nine to 12 months for all of those. But it could be an option on the table. So the, the default is the, the staff decision the staff certification, but you have that option. So we can show you samples of that language, definitely. Sure. Yes, I just want to mention, yeah, that I just want to reiterate, I don't think a 200-foot notice radius is sufficient for something like that. So definitely would like you all to expand it. It doesn't need to be the whole city. I'm not saying that, but 200 feet is, is not um, sufficient. And then I, she actually uh, brought up what I was going to bring up. I'd like to see more about the option if uh, it's a hot button with the community, this community meeting. Uh, I'd like to see uh, an option for it to be uh, referred to PNZ and council as opposed to continue just the staff approval process. Just to follow up uh, to earlier, um, this director, this upstairs individual, man, woman, whomever director is, where where do they who who are they accountable to? To the city manager, to the council, who who puts them in as the director, and should they run amok? <laughs> who, pull, who pulls back on them? I, I just want to I want it said. Yeah, it's the city manager. I'm sorry? City manager. Okay. So that makes me very confident. I'll tell you why. Those of you that don't know, understand this and are watching this, the council puts the city manager in place. So there is a check and balance that I certainly love because every single day, correct me if I'm wrong, there are things that council have put into place over the many years of this beautiful city that we never even think about that the city manager and his staff uh, uh continue every day. We, we don't have to look at everything every day. So council puts it into place, its directors in place. 
I feel better about that, knowing that our city manager essentially would be accountable for the director should council be troubled by it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so to follow up with what William said, that's particularly important because not only does the director have responsibility for all of this, the director has, there are 31 circumstances where the director can make exceptions. So it is really important to have this checks and balances there. Because so I've got tremendous confidence in our current director. We don't know, she's not going to be there forever and ever, but, you know, there'll be somebody new at some point. So it is important to have a check and balance with 31 um, exceptions that the director can make. Okay. There are a couple of other um, kind of administrative elements that we just wanted to point out. Um, part of what we heard again from the development community was looking for opportunities for flexibility and um, zoning is, is often very rigid. And so um, we do have uh, minor modifications to district standards with which authorize some greater flexibility for approving minor deviations for things, um, certain dimensional standards. Um, this can compensate for an unusual site condition. It could protect a sensitive resource, natural feature, or community asset. And um, it would ensure that it's not producing an adverse change to the neighborhood character. Um, so, so an example I like to think about is if you have a building setback um, requirement and your site is not a perfect square, it's rounded. Well, instead of having to push your whole building back, you can have your corners come in just, you know, a couple of feet into that building setback. So that's the kind of minor deviation we're talking about. I think it's a 10% um, ability to, to deviate from the standard. Good question. Question. Okay. Um, so that does, just to confirm, that does not pertain to the uh, 350 units in the rack or the 150 right. units or any of the numbers that are in the lane. These plan is strictly on the what you've mentioned there. Right, right. Um, and then another element that's really important um, as we think about um, infill and, and um, incremental redevelopment is the applicability matrix, which um, provides direction on what elements of the code would be applied to a um, redevelopment or a partial redevelopment or depending on what kind of change is being made to a site. This will tell you which standards you have to comply with, whether it's the connectivity or the, the street frontage or um, you know, just the other different code sections. And so that's a question that comes up a lot of times with applicants and with, with staff. And so this hopefully just clarifies what standards have to be um, followed for a particular um, development. So for example, if you have an existing um, strip center and they want to add a patio on the exterior of the building, we're not going to say you have to go rip out your whole site and comply with everything that's in the code, you're going to comply with whatever applies to that new little piece that you're, you're adding on to your site. Um, so the, the sixth and final um, key uh, element that we want to talk about tonight is accelerating redevelopment. Um, so we are, uh, Matt, as Matt suggested or commented on earlier, um, recommending that we initiate rezoning for some key areas in the city. Um, this proactive or city-initiated rezoning, um, we hope will signal interest in redevelopment to um, our property owners and development community and has the ability to accelerate redevelopment because it does re reduce project timelines. So as was mentioned, we've talked about no matter what to put zoning on these properties, we're going to have to go through a process. And so if we go ahead and do that ahead of when a project is ready, when we do have a project come forward, we can really shorten that process and make it more um, financially feasible for it to come to fruition. Um, this also enables us to look at a more holistic approach rather than parcel by parcel, um, because as property owners come in, there we're just going to we could have an application for you know just a couple of acres within a rack or an act. Um, in this case, the city can initiate rezoning for multiple properties at one time. And so our initial recommendations are to move forward with rezoning the uni University Boulevard Regional Activity Center in its entirety. Um, so this is the area with Smart Financial, Texas Instruments, and U of H. Um, and then we're looking at um, the Lake Point Regional Activity Center, um, but not rezoning it in its entirety, really just focusing on that 50 acres or so um, that is the uh, Fleur campus right now. So it's kind of this acreage right here where we're hoping to see some redevelopment take place. Um, and these are really based on city council's priority areas, largely, um, that were established um, previously. Ruth, yes, sir. 
Ruth, um, does the uh, University Boulevard rack uh, MUR and the Lake Point rack MUR have to be the same? Or can we have the University Boulevard MUR have different requirements than Lake Point? The way that the code is drafted, they are the same. Um, there are different communities that do that differently. Um, you you could theoretically have an overlay district that differentiated them differently. Um, in one sense, we have the land use plan, which establishes different thresholds. Um, and so that that does make them different, but the standards in, in the code itself um, would be the same. I'm going to make a suggestion. Okay. We're going to make a suggestion that you move uh, forward with the like point and let's not Let's let's do this thing so the public gets a gets a feel for what we're doing. Do the Lake Point. I wouldn't do the University Boulevard this time. Let's see how the Lake Point goes. Okay. And see what happens there and how how that goes. And let's do more or less a dry run, and then we can look at and at, at uh, then we can figure out where we go from there. Okay. Question. Sure. Yeah. And how would um future rezoning work on the University Boulevard rack when, because uh, U of H is not uh, subject to the city's zoning, but I know right. we obviously want to work with them and have a, a common vision and stuff like that. So what's the benefit of rezoning U of H to our zoning that doesn't apply to them? Exactly what you just said, to have a common oh. vision, okay. because there are times we have opportunities to work with them if there's something that they need from us or they feel like what what is it the city wants sometimes we do have the opportunity to work with them and so at least it's very clear this is our vision for this area this is what we expect of other developers in the area um and so we feel like it's it's appropriate to go ahead and put it on that property so what if the town center rack was proactively rezoned to a mixed use uh, uh, activity thing and then uh, methodist comes in so it's and which requires residential so then methodist comes in but methodist wants to buy part of the say AMC uh, parking lot, you know, for their ex expansion. Mm -hmm. So then, so, so we've gone through this whole long uh, six to nine month, whatever, rezoning process and the Methodist comes in and wants to buy it. So then we'd have to go through and have it rezoned from the mixed use activity uh, center to the um, to BO or something like that then. That's actually one of the reasons we're not recommending that we move forward with town center immediately is because we need to look at those potential possibilities in some of these areas. Um, there are a lot of different properties that are already developed, obviously. And so we need to look at what would the impact be if we did rezone to the mixed use districts. And we wanna to talk to the property owners and find out what are their future plans and, and make sure that we're not um, kind of going out on a limb where it doesn't make sense to. Um, and so, you know, we know that in, in the University Boulevard area and the Fleur area, there are potential for development and redevelopment kind of coming forward. And so that's, again, some of the reason that we had anticipated um, or suggested that we move forward with the proactive rezoning there, but not in, in town center, for example. We are gonna be initiating a um, small area plan through um, the Houston Galveston Area Council. We got a grant for what's called a livable center study. Um, and it actually is going to cover um, both Lake Point town center and then a couple of other neighborhood activity centers. And so through that process, we anticipate engaging with those property owners and with the public. Um, and so we, we would love to hear from them through that process. What are their future plans and how can this um, these districts open up opportunities for them um, for development or redevelopment in the future? Okay. Well, a small area plan might make more sense than that table, whatever it is, 5112 with the 20% on every two acres and sure. a, uh, site that's uh, available in a neighborhood activity site. I, and I agree. Um, I think it would be great if we had small area plans in place for all of these that we could rely on to provide that mix. In the absence of that, I think that this is a good kind of interim measure. We may get to a point where once we have small area plans for all of these areas or the majority of them, maybe we don't need that anymore. And again, that just goes back to the idea that we're gonna have to keep looking at this document. Um, <laughs> this is what we think is our is our, is a great first you know step in the process, but we're gonna have to look at it again in the future and it's gonna need to evolve. Oh, I just had a quick question. When you had said that these were the two we were gonna start with, mm -hmm. does that mean there had already been developers who were interested in these two areas and we're kind of already 
meeting with them and that's and are we looking at like this vote it will be july 18th that that would be early this year that could happen um we we don't have an exact timeline laid out for these rezoning yet um we had anticipated that they would start kind of towards the tail end of or right after we um, adopt the mixed use code, but we haven't necessarily lined out a specific timeline for when we would be doing that. But we have spoken with people who are interested in development and redevelopment in these areas. And are those the same developers, like on page 10, you had made some quotes, developing in Sugarland as a waste of time and money? Or I, mean, I just, I'm curious of who these developers are yeah. for yeah. saying this. Yeah, I think the answer is some of them are, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Susan. Susan um, you, you yeah, I think. Uh, just curious, Ruth. We're not doing all of Lake Point. It's probably one of the most rack type of developments out there, except for Town Square. So why are we not doing it all at one time? Because there is a lot of PD in there. Most of it is PD. Actually, the Fleur campus technically is the, the oldest PD that we have in the city. Um, and there's some very specific standards that are established in like the residential areas, and they were very carefully curated for that particular area. And so um, at least initially, we don't feel like it makes sense to go in and change that. We may find in the future that that makes sense to go ahead and do that. But initially, um, there's also a lot of property owners that we would need to work with and talk to, um, you know, just in terms of that the phone calls that would come in when we send out the notices and things like that. Um, and so this is our focus for redevelopment. And so that's why we feel like that's where we need to start. Michelle. Ruth, based, based on what the mayor just said about the University Boulevard Rack, and I know you all were thinking that you're going to move forward with this, and you mentioned some grant money. Maybe we can utilize some of that grant money to study this area mm. as well right now. Um, because you were probably thinking we're moving forward, but, and I agree with what Mayor said, put this one on hold, but you utilize some of that grant money, just uh -huh. an idea to study this area. Yeah, we do actually have another um, process we're going to be going through to look at this area in particular and um, engaging some of the property owners nearby as well as the ones within the area. So a little bit like a small area plan, but a little bit different. Um, it won't be with that same process that we're doing Lake Point and um, Town Center that's unfortunately kind of locked in with HGAC, but um, we are going to be doing a, um, some evaluation of the kind of track five area. Yeah, because you'll, you'll recall during Carol and I's town hall, and we had residents here just sure. tonight that spoke about smart financial and yeah. the traffic and everything. Right. It'd be good to utilize some dollars there. Right. Okay. Mr. Sure. Um, going back to um, like where we have the mixes, you know, I think it's it's back in, it's sort of really preface on page five, but we had talked about, you know, introducing these different types of um, housing. Mm -hmm. Don't we need to go and update the land use plan to say, well, you know, what's the percentage of these types of housing mm. we want to have in that particular rack or next? Because when the director, if we go that far, that starts to make those decisions, and we've got to sort of understand what that mix is. I mean, we've got percentages, you know, mm -hmm. for multifamily, right. but now we're introducing cottages and things of that nature. Right. What, what will the, you know, there's really no direction we have. Right on uh, that type of housing within within the land use plan. Right, and I would think that um, that would be a great candidate for conversation through the small area plans, um, because at that point you're really focusing on a particular area, and you're saying what what's the the best mix here, or how can this be laid out best? What are the most appropriate uses here? And you can really hone in on the vision for that area as opposed to doing it citywide, because then you're also engaging specifically the property owners that own there and are nearby there, the, you know, the neighborhoods that are nearby there as well. So how is, are those plans going to connect with the land use plan yeah. and this zone? So the, the, the small area plans would be kind of an extension of the, the land use plan, the comprehensive plan. It would kind of refine those broader visions that are established in the land use plan. Um, it could be that they replace pieces of the land use plan. We haven't necessarily gotten to that step of, of making that final determination, but um, that would be sort of the vision for what they would do is provide a little more refined vision for an area and how 
how it could develop, redevelop over time. And in those plans, it's, I mean, on that same page, it says the director can approve alternative mixes depending, you mm -hmm. know, there's some criteria there. If it's an alternative, if it's an alternative mix of uses, it still has to be within the use plan or it would still have to go through a, pro a change process, correct? The like, land use plan or the no, land no, uses? Back, back to the... Yes, yes. So it would, yeah. still, it would be so, a mix of uses of those that are permitted in the district. Permit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Um, yes, to follow on what Mary said, um, in the land use plan, 12% is for multifamily and then the 88% is for single family uh, residential and that was single family homes. And the intent of that was in single family residential neighborhoods. Because at the time when we did the land use plan, 2014 to 2018, we had never heard of cottage court developments mm -hmm. or anything like that. So this um, this middle housing that we're talking about, cottage courts and urban homes, higher density, single family homes are not in that 88%, that's only single family homes and single family neighborhoods. So yes, there's uh, that, that can't count toward the 88%. But one thing that Matt said earlier that I wanted to follow, because I was playing my, trying to hold my questions to the end, but I didn't quite make it. So, um, you know, multifamily means more than one family. So he was talking about increasing the multifamily to be seven plus families coming together before that could even be considered multifamily. So what is that based on and why are we doing that? Um, it basically, gosh, I'm trying to remember, um, somebody help me out here if you can jump in. The Right now, the definition says anything over five units on a single lot is considered multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, by changing that definition, we are allowing for some of those missing middle housing um, to take place and not... Um, not fall under the classification of multifamily because they are house scale. They are not, you know, 200 unit complexes like you have here or, um, you know, in other parts of the city. And so it has a different impact um, than the large developments. And, and so it just allows for some variety in housing and, um, you know, provides for different people to have different kinds of places to live um, a little more easily. I'm, I'm more comfortable keeping up the five plus just for my two cents worth. And then but, uh, going back to the, um, the, the the tiny, the court cottage course that was uh, mentioned earlier. Yes. So they shall not be sub subdivided into individual lots for sale. Right. But those are not going to be rental. I guess they can be rental homes. So they're, they're not rental homes or they are rental homes where it talks about they can't be subdivided into individual lots for sale. Or yeah, so they could be, they could be rental or they could be um divided and become like condos. It could be a condo regime where you own the building, but not like the land. Um, and so it could go either way. Okay. And so pursuant to the early conversation on page 68, the, the part about the um, pre-manufactured yes. homes with the um, the wheels removed. Yes, that, that's, that's an error. That, that part's going to be um, <clears throat> removed. Yes. Okay, so I apologize for that confusion. So there is another place in the um, the actual land use table where Cottage Court is defined on page 33, and right. you will see that is not there. Right, that's correct. It's not we, there. We did, you may remember we actually talked about that. I think yeah. it went yeah. to the task force we, meetings. We, yeah, we and so we did take it out of there. It just inadvertently, the old definition got put into the Chapter 10 part of it, and so um, that was that was just an oversight. Okay, so so all the all the homes, the, the different types of homes will be built to the standard building codes. Correct. Because that's, that's good because on the pre-manufactured homes, those are considered personal property and they're taxed at a lower property oh, tax okay. rate. Yeah. But, to get, but the only homes built on site mm. are considered real estate I tax. See. Interesting. Tax. But yeah, if you take it on the tax rate. I think that was that. an example that was used in another city where they allowed for tiny homes. Mm -hmm. Those are considered those, you know, manufactured homes. And so I think that's that's just the example. So, so we have tiny homes on page 30. So is the I'm tiny homes, say, gonna, is tiny homes going to go then on page 30? Because, you know, we're talking about, you know, the cottage house like 1,000 square feet, but tiny homes are more around 600 square feet. But now we're talking about tiny homes on page 30, and those are typically the pre-manufactured homes too. So is that going to change? I think Eric, I think Stewart's got some input on this. Let me, let me go right now. So this is something we can fight about later, right? We don't have to put cottage homes in in the final ordinance. We can fight we can fight about this another day. 
in a Protestant sponsor. Yeah, I'm no. just trying to narrow the definition. Right, of right, right, right. This is, but we'll we'll fight about that later. We'll, I mean, we'll have more and more workshops where we'll we'll, we'll hone well, in we, on this, exactly. No, this, this is a, this is a workshop right here. This is it, Stuart. Until we get to PNZ, but yeah. So, of course. Oh, thank you. We're going to need a hell of a lot more opportunities oh, okay. to, to don't take think that, There's nothing scheduled between now and the PNC works. I'll put it that way. The PNC. Yeah, this, yeah, there's no way that this is. There's no way that this is going to fly exactly. You, you, I mean, all the input you're going to fix, right? Mm -hmm. All the input you got. We're, okay. we're going to see a couple more iterations of this. So just to clarify, on page 30, what where you were reading about tiny homes, that's just commentary. That's not code language. So I mean, that's going to come out when we adopt the ordinance. That's just kind of trying to explain why we have what we have in the draft code. Um, so those are not anticipated to be included. Okay, good. Okay. I do have a few slides and I know it's getting late, so I will try and move through this quickly. Um, but I did want you to know that we have done some resident engagement. Um, starting late last year and into early this year, we um, did a variety of community engagement kind of on redevelopment broadly, but we also talked specifically about things like missing middle housing and some of the, the, some of the elements that we knew we were going to be addressing in the draft code in one way or another. We talked about the economic development cycle and mixed use development. Um, we, through that process, we engaged over 600 attendees at over 20 community meetings. Um, we went to some HOA meetings and some other interest groups, as well as um, city events. Um, what we heard from the community at that time was um, that they were really interested to hear the data that we shared about how our community is aging and things like that. Um, they understand that Sugarland is substantially built out and recognize that what has worked in the past may not work in the future. Um, we did hear a lot of um, folks were favorable to housing variety, um, particularly those that were looking to downsize. And they were kind of concerned. What was what's what life going to look like for me in ten to fifteen years when there's not a place for me to downsize here in Sugarland? Um, also looking for a place for their children and parents to live nearby. Um, we did hear a few times people encouraging caution when creating these districts. Um, we heard about Sharpstown or Fondren Southwest, um, and in references. Um, and, and to that point, I just would like to um, suggest that we consider. Sharpstown, Fondren Southwest is like saying that's an apple, and it's, 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 it's as similar to what we're talking about here as an Apple phone, iPhone. They have the same word in them, but they are not the same thing. We're not talking about creating the, the density, the numbers of units, or the type of quality, or the, the type of housing, the, the development type. It's just, it's not the same thing. Or the, or the um, lack of zoning. The lack of zoning, the lack of code enforcement. I mean, there's just... There are so many things that make it wildly different. Um, so we also had a town hall meeting last night. Um, we had about 30 in attendance and um, we did have, they were very interested in hearing about the code. Um, we, we had some just general kind of uh, under, lack, lacking understanding or desire to understand zoning kind of in general and what is by right. We did have some folks that are, had, um, you know, just kind of a fear of change and, and wanted to know what impact will these new districts have on, on the community? Um, there was some emphasis on safeguards and oversight and um, just understanding of indicators of success and, and how do we know if we've gotten there in the end. Um, again, we heard more interest in um, housing options and support for missing middle. And um, there were some questions about multifamily and the level of council oversight, which I think we've covered pretty extensively this evening. Um, we also thought it was important to engage directly with our development community. Um, we've, we've talked with folks that have developed here and also those who haven't. Um, we um, first had a, a developer roundtable back in March where we went through a draft of the code with them at that point in time. And um, we heard some things like Sugarland is long overdue for looking at these kinds of standards. Um, kudos to the city for its progressive planning. And um, they liked the environmental considerations. Um, they also suggested that we ensure that we balance guidance and control with creativity. So making sure there's room for creativity um, while we're providing um, guidance and um, providing flexibility where we can so we're not creating some of the same issues that we have today. Um, they indicated that financial feasibility for some of these projects largely depends on some higher density residential, um, not really offices or, or retail. And so that's where we got that kind of sweet spot of buy right multifamily and MUR being 350. 
Um, we also heard that redevelopment of smaller sites is going to necessitate city partnership on things like utilities and other infrastructure for walkable environments. We met again with them yesterday to review the latest draft of the code, which is the same one that you have seen tonight. And um, we talked about things like incentives and how does an expedited review, how does it really work? What does expedited mean? Um, we looked at parking and um, talked about how it's currently a significant barrier to redevelopment, but they felt like the proposed reductions are really positive. Um, we got some additional support from the development community on um, the expansion of, of housing types. Um, there were questions about mechanisms for moderately, moderately priced housing or senior housing, um, and then just had some kind of clarification comments um, and on the code kind of organization and, and just overall clarity in a few places. And we talked extensively about the multifamily amenities table, um, what should be a baseline requirement, which is what should kind of go above and beyond, um, and then um, looking at existing projects, how do they compare? So like taking the parole and, and comparing it against the draft code. Um, and then finally, um, kind of just general process questions about um, sort of like we've talked about tonight, what happens in the process? Where does the rezoning, the concept plan and the site plan and, and, and things like that? And then um, what input would be required to be incorporated into a project? Again, I think that was a question we heard this evening too, when you're looking at a mixed use concept plan. Um, so this is just a list of the folks that we had um, at the two uh, meetings between the two. We had 30 attendees. A lot of them were the same folks between the two, but we felt like we had really great attendance and good engagement from the group. So with that, I'm wrapping up. I promise we're almost done. Um, I just want to reiterate, this is an evolving draft, and we welcome your comments and your suggestions, and we thank you so much for your engagement tonight. This has been a really good discussion. Um, we know that we need to reevaluate re the uh, multifamily amenities table and continue to refine for clarity and consistency in the draft based on all the feedback that we've received. Um, we um, really are looking to you to tell us, are we headed in the right direction? Are we being trailblazing enough to take us to that next level, to take us to that, that next step um, for our community? Um, and so for next step specifically for the code, um, we do have the draft online for the community to provide feedback um, until next Friday, um, May 19th at the, the webpage there. Um, we also anticipate making revisions after that and in hopes of having them wrapped up well, we may be changing this based on the conversation tonight, but um, we were aiming for June 15th so that we could get in front of the commission um, with a public hearing and recommendation um, in June and then following up with city council in um, July and August. And then once it's all said and done, once it's adopted, we still we will implement, we will continue to evaluate and modify as needed um, as we go forward. Okay, so if you go back to that. Yes, sir. So I think there's an additional step here. One okay. Is one is the, the comments, you know, we, there were a number of questions that were asked by the public. We need to answer those questions. A number of questions that were asked by the public and we need to answer those questions and we'll, we'll leave it. I'm, I know you guys have got all those questions, so let's get that answered. Okay. I think there are probably a number of comments from the council members and from the PNZ members with regard, let's, Let's take a look at what those are. Let's go through that. Let's look at how that applies to what's currently written. Okay. I suggest that the additional step is we're going to have another another meeting uh, like this, a public okay. comment. Uh, I'd say it's 30 days out so that we can get everything addressed and then have another public hearing with an overview you know, basically, here's how we answered the questions. Here's the feedback that we've received. I suspect there's going to be a lot of feedback on, on social media. We'll go over that, and then we can look at, you know, a, a, a next draft of what the ordinance uh, says based on the feedback that you've received tonight. Okay. And then from there, we'll figure out what the final schedule is. Okay. Question? <laughs> Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wanted to have a comment. Got some feedback today because since last night had been advertised as a town hall, mm -hmm. residents were expecting to be a, a town hall, like the district town halls, where you could have a public Q and A in the in the chamber, sure. where you could hear the, everybody's questions and, and everybody and your answer to the different questions. So I, people were some people were really disappointed sure. in, in that because it didn't meet 
their expectations for what a town hall was. I understand. And then also, uh, I know we've, you've talked to some city staff and some other cities. So what are some examples of projects that have been developed, uh, preferably in Texas, under mixed-use zoning districts like you're talking about proposing for us? And can you provide us with, with the links to them and how long have they been in place and have there been any uh, you know, consequences or anything with that? And, and how similar are those to um, what you're talking about here? Um, I don't have them off the top of my head if there's any of my colleagues behind me that knows them off the top of their head. Okay, okay. for later. And then this is this is mainly to you can provide it later, but you don't have to provide it tonight. But okay. I really would like to see some price that has been that not not just conversations going on about this, but who've specifically had mixed use zoning districts like what's being proposed. Okay. They've actually they're they're a lot years ahead of us. They've okay. already build it using this particular, you know, regional activity zoning district or NAC or whatever. And it's, it's there and it's functioning and where is it and how is it? Let us know what they are. We can, we can certainly do that. We'll find some projects. Um, but I do want to clarify that every zoning code is different. Right. They're yeah, all tailored like, to their own community. Like, and so none of them will be just like our code. Right. But it means some similar, some similar yes. the similarity, I guess that's why I should say. Understood. Yeah. I mean, I think the Pearl in San Antonio is a, it was a key concept. Mm -hmm. It was an extraordinary project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was, it, was it approved under a mixed? I don't know anything about the zoning uh, on that property. Like we can look into that. that, that phase one Over report, the, the phase one report that we talked about had a lot of examples from Fort Worth and from Lewis. We can bring those back. Yeah, yeah, so none of those were PDs. So those, yeah. none of those were PDs. They were all mixed use zoning districts. There were a combination, but a lot of them were mixed use. Okay. Yeah, yeah if you'd let us know. Thank you. Mayor, two quick comments. Yeah, sure. Um, so I want to go back to um, Stuart did a great job of articulating the fact that there's going to be criteria in place. Can you talk just a little bit about what is the process for providing feedback on that particular criteria from our two respective bodies? That's a great question. Um, so one option would be to go to this um scan this and go to that that web page or you can go to sugarlandtx.gov forward slash activity centers and um, there is a place um, we're using a tool called conveyo where you can place um, comments in the basically on the pdf um, the task force used that for a previous revision review um, the other thing you can do is mark up a pdf if that's easier for you if you want to send us your comments that way um, whether you do it digitally or handwrite it and and scan it and send it in, um, you know we can take your comments however you'd like to to get them to us. We would ask for you to get them to us by the end of next week, um, so we can have them in tandem with the public comments. Or let us know if you're not going to make that, um, and we can we can look at the schedule. Conveo, okay. we prefer Conveo. Um, <laughs> that that to me, I mean, it, it feels like it calls for a, a bit of a of a discussion about what you know from a vision standpoint but maybe i'm not processing what do you mean the, well i mean you've got things like we're talking about like creating a pedestrian realm what does that actually mean i mean i don't i'm not i'm not um you know versed enough on all of the things that would need to be considered to actually provide that feedback like block breaks mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff like that's that seems to me like things that will need to be codified in advance so that it's part of the certification process. Yeah, but, that's what's in this code. Right, and I, I mean, yes. Um, so I guess I guess we could probably provide feedback on what's what's in there. It, it just um, okay. It, it, I just think it's an important step, mm -hmm. and I want to be sure that that there's adequate opportunity to to provide that feedback, which you touched okay. on. The last thing I'll mention is. Um, it, it, there's a lot of talk about the director mm -hmm. having um, certification authority, and this is more of a council decision than P and D purview, to be sure. But it just seems like if we're trying to build trust with the community, why why wouldn't that certification lie with the city manager, even if it's a perfunctory, you know, it goes it's going to go through the process. Why not just add one step that's a direct report to the city council? It's just something to consider. I'm, I'm not going to argue for it. I'll just put it out there as as a, a tool that we could use to build trust with the community. You're talking about the mixed use concept plan specifically? No, it's talking about where it, everywhere it, it, says, code, it says director, but you, in, you insert city manager. Yeah. Or is it designated? Sure. 
Sure. Ruth, I'd, I'd like to make a proposal. Um, my request would be that you take all the input mm -hmm. that you all have received and incorporate it and whittle it down and whatever, then distribute the updated copy to these two bodies with whatever that magic is that we can do the online comments or whatever. And let us, let us, you know, give us a week to do the comments after you've, after you've updated it. Mm, okay. Because, because, I mean, I don't want to have to go through and tell you, oh, I don't want, uh, I don't want uh, trailer homes with uh, the wheels removed. Right. We already did and, that. And, and, <laughs> right. So, so, so could you please mark it up and then distribute it and give us a week sure. to comment? Sure. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. And it still stands, though, as it's open today, if you want to go in and take a look if there's anything we haven't talked about this evening that you think is important to incorporate into the next version, please take the opportunity to go to that Conveo link and, and place your comments in there. We promise to be brief. Uh, Mike, if I may, thank you for leading, in a very difficult time, our vision to this city. This takes a lot of work. I know it does. I can see it's probably wearing on you. I hear your team and they are doing a great job. I wanted to tell you that. Thank you for taking our vision to this city. In closing, I'd like to thank the uh, members of the public that provided the comments. Uh, I'd like to thank staff for putting this together, the consultants, uh, and certainly the Planning and Zoning Commission and the council members. It's 9.04. We stand adjourned. And P and Z is also adjourned. Have a great evening. <laughs>